Uh, at 5.01 p.m., I call this uh, regular board meeting of the BRSSD uh, school board to order. Uh, will we all please rise and face the flag? Okay, uh, I'm number three announcements. Are there any announcements to share with the public? Uh, there are no announcements. Okay, uh, item number four. So this is speakers wishing to address the board. Um, the, uh, let's see. Public has the right to address the board on any agenda item or non agenda item within the jurisdiction of the board. Uh, to do so, please submit a card, one of those green cards, uh, to Ms. Ellinger, noting the agenda item if applicable. Non agenda items we will hear now. Agenda related comments we will hear during that item's discussion. Uh, public comments are limited to three minutes per person uh, per topic. In fairness to all, we ask everyone to respect the time limits. Um, if you have brought comments, that you uh, would like to be read from another individual. Uh, please submit those to our board secretary, Mr. Taguara, and he will read those uh, into the record or submit them to the board for their um, awareness, depending on your preference. Uh, if addressing a non, uh, the board on a non-agenda item, please be aware that the provisions of the Brown Act prohibit the board from acting on or discussing such matters at this meeting, including responding. Um, Let's see, Ms. Ellinger, are there any requests for public comment? Yes, there are. Okay. So first we'd like to have Spencer Lang come up to speak about Ralston enrollment. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Spencer Liang and I'm a father of three girls. We live up on Hallmark Drive, on Hallmark Drive on Somerset for the last 15 years. I'm here today about my oldest daughter, Kira, who is entering sixth grade from out of district and was assigned to Nesbitt. My two younger daughters are in district attending Fox. We wrote a letter to the district, but did not hear back, so here to express my thoughts. We entered Kira in the first round of school applications because we really wanted her to attend Ralston. We have nothing against Nesbitt, but Nesbitt is three times farther from our home than Ralston is. And as you know, crossing Belmont during rush hour can range from frustrating to nightmarish. Although I understand Ralston is impacted, I struggle to understand why proximity to the school is not factored for students coming out of district, which seems starkly inconsistent with the policy for elementary school that factors in proximity. Further, having this policy only causes people to create workarounds, as we know families that enter the district in fifth grade just to get priority in Ralston. So I'm not sure what this really accomplishes. I feel quite abandoned by the district, frankly. We ask that you don't punish us for not having Kira attend BRSSD elementary schools. We are residents of Belmont. We pay here, we stay here for 15 years and we pay our property tax every year. In our case, my two younger daughters are also in, in Fox, in district. This makes drop-off physically near impossible for us to be able to do a sequential drop-off at Fox and Nesbitt at the required times. According to the enrollment FAQ that is online, the district describes a quote, commitment to keeping siblings together at the same school minimizing the stress on families by avoiding multiple drop-offs at different schools. While I realize this is not quite exactly the same case, the proximity of Fox to Ralston kind of implies that this is the same principles. However, there's no consideration given to younger siblings in district. We ask that having younger siblings in the district also be considered as a factor. Finally, we did enter care into a lottery for transfer spots into Ralston. This lottery will take place in early July, as you know. However, I'm wondering, will there be any spots? I have not seen any announcement informing parents that there is a wait list for schools that and that for people on, on the wait list and that parents should plan to withdraw such that others can take their spot. To this point, I've met several parents who have kids assigned to Ralston uh, and already intend to withdraw to enter private schools, yet do not have any urgency or awareness to do so or even know how to withdraw. So we ask that the district please send out a reminder to all those assigned to Ralston but intend to give up their spot to notify them before the first lottery. So in summary, very simply, we ask that for the upcoming lottery, priority be considered based on proximity in the district for both rounds of the lottery process. Right now, it's only for the first round. And then a notice be sent out to all parents asking that if they tend to withdraw, 
to please do so before the first lottery. Please let me know if there's anyone else I can talk to about this matter. That's, that's just one quick comment. Always happy to talk with you. Uh, we actually are doing uh, just that. We're actually completing that process. So glad you're on the list and uh, happy to connect with you all. Thank you. Ms. Ellinger, are there any other requests for public comment on another topic? Yes, so we have a series of public comments in regards to um, teacher retention salary benefits um, from various school sites. So the first one, the person I'd like to call up is James Nesbitt. Ms. Ellinger, if we can uh, call two people at once so we can have the second person uh, okay. have to speak right behind. So could I also get Susan from Sandpiper? First uh, first, I just want to thank the board for letting me address them and also to start out by saying that I think uh, BRSSD is an amazing district, so much so that I bring my own son to school there uh, and do not have him enrolled in Cabrillo and Half Moon Bay. However, I think that the district is at a crisis point right now, and that crisis point is teacher retention. And I think the two major issues that we deal with in teacher retention right now are salaries and, for lack of a better term, and, uh, an unrealistic expectation with work work with workloads right now. Um, specifically speaking, I have already seen four teachers leave my my grade level in the, in the last two years. Uh, two of my teachers left last year because of the cost of living here. Uh, I lost another teacher in December, and we lost a science teacher early in the year. Um, I know in the past that we have not even met COLA on certain times in terms of the offers that we've gotten. And right now, the cost of living in the Bay Area is astronomical. Um, to give just a slight example, uh, for Social Security, they've increased the benefits of Social Security 8.7%. Um, and I have never once seen the point where over the course of two to three years, we've increased salaries to that level. That's also compounded by the fact that we live in the Bay Area and it's super, super expensive. Uh, the fact that the district is now offering incentives to recruit people is a testament to the fact that we're losing all these people due to the fact that the cost of living is so expensive, and that's a major problem. Another issue that we're dealing with constantly is the amount of workload that we have. Um, the idea of job creep, where we are not taking anything on the off the board and constantly adding new things, is very realistic for us. Um, for example, we have Youth Truth now, we have My Sabres, we have uh, Puma Families, we have all these things that we didn't have before, and I constantly am struggling to get through my instructional time due to the other expectations that are put on us. Now, as I said before, I think that Belmont Redwood Shores is an amazing school district, but one that is facing a major crisis due to the issues of salaries and overwork. Thank you for your time. Hey, next one, Paula Mencius. Hi, my name is Paula Mencius. I'm a school psychologist at Nesbitt and sometimes at other school sites. Um, I'm here to not only support our school community, but the communities of children and families. As a school psychologist, uh, almost 20 years doing this, I love Nesbitt. I love being the uh, being able to do a variety of things and uh, helping children with mental health, behavior, evaluations, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately for this year, because the salaries have not kept up, uh, we've had two open positions out of a total of seven for the entire school year. Um, this has heavily impacted many, uh, many people, not just the children we can't get to, but the children that we cannot even get into the pipeline, so to speak. So, um, and school psychologists, unlike teachers, can pretty much go anywhere they want because they're credentialed from pre-K all the way through high school. And so it's not just, um, they're, they're gonna go where the money is pretty much because they are they have a wide range of skills. So I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate what you'll be hearing a lot from, from us guys is that really to support the school as a whole, to be able to recruit and retain highly qualified staff, especially school psychologists who are very good at, uh, preventing things from going south. And so I uh, just wanted to encourage you to consider that as well. Thank you. So Susan Nichols, and then if we can get Pamela and Julie Oser behind me. Go ahead, Susan. Sure. 
So my name is Susan Nichols, and this is my 16th year in the district. I teach second grade at Sam Piper, but I'm not here tonight to talk about myself. I'm here to talk on behalf of other teachers at my site who have asked me to step forward. Um, one particular teacher wanted to be here tonight, but she's working her second job right now. I would have loved to attend the board, so I'll be reading their statements to you that will put it into the record if I read it. Yes? Are, are you going to be reading your own comments as well, or are you just going to be reading someone else's comments? Um, reading theirs on behalf of them, which is how we've done it in the past. Okay. So if you're going to read your own comments as well, then you're limited to three minutes total. If you're going to read no, someone I'm, else's comments, can you, can you start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is all going to be under three minutes. Okay. The whole thing. Okay. She says, this is a, sec, a first grade teacher at Sam Piper. I would have loved to, have, to attend the board meeting tonight, but unfortunately I am at my second job. I'm sure my nine other coworkers who also have second jobs would agree that they would like to be here to support the other teachers here today. I obviously didn't become a teacher for the money, but the pressures from parents and administration, in addition to poor student behavior is simply not worth the pay I receive. Teaching post pandemic continues to negatively affect my physical and mental health. Some people say they admire my resilience, though I am on the verge of giving up every day. I am unmarried and living in one of the most expensive zip codes in the United States and won't be able to afford to work at an amazing school or live in my 300 square foot studio much longer. It's shameful how much our union has to fight for a meager salary increase for the hardest workers in town. The second message that I wanted to share with you is from our reading specialist and her husband, who are both teachers at our school. They are young parents, of, they have a young family. Aaron works two separate jobs apart from Sam Piper, being the athletic director and coaching VR assisted teams. Our average cost of childcare is about $2,100 a month and rent continues to rise. Each year we consider moving to a more affordable area where we can purchase a house, be less stressed about finances and spend more time together as a family. We love our Sam Piper community, but feel as though we are constantly drowning and trying to keep up with the cost of living skyrocketing. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Pamela Miller. Um, my daughter went to Fox. I teach at Cipriani and we've lived in the community for about 12 years. As a parent, teacher and community member, I want to talk about the crucial issue and it deserves our attention. Um, we need to support our better salaries and benefits for our teachers. Teachers dedicate their lives to shaping the minds of future generations, nurturing their potential, inspiring them to reach for the stars. Yet despite their invaluable contributions, many teachers face uh, financial challenges and limited benefits. It's time we recognize the immense value of our educators and invest in their well-being. Competitive salaries and comprehensive benefits are essential to attract and retain the best talent in our classrooms. When teachers struggle to make ends meet, it affects their morale and their ability to provide the quality education our children deserve. We must ensure that they have fair compensation that reflects their expertise, dedication, and the immense responsibilities that they shoulder. Moreover, comprehensive benefits are vital to provide our teachers with a sense of security and stability. These benefits serve as the foundation for their overall well being. By investing in our teachers, we invest in our children's future. Let us rally together, advocate for improved teacher salaries and benefits and ensure that our educational system and Belmont Redwood Shore School District remains the strong, vibrant, and capable community it is. Before you start, Julie, if I could get Janet and Allison and Robin from Redwood Shore. Yeah. Okay. First, before I begin with my little speech, I want to say to my colleagues that are out here, it's National Speech and Language Day today. <laughs> so, I'm here to say that, um, and I wanted to follow Pamela because I wanted to voice a lot of what she said. So I'm here to say that my three children were product or a product of the dedicated teachers of both Cipriani and Ralston. 
Amanda, my oldest daughter, has her master's in higher education and is the executive director of alumni relations and engagement at Cal Poly and San Luis Obispo. My son, Nick, is a doctor of child psychology at Kaiser. And my youngest daughter, Melissa, is a doctor of physical therapy in Portland. Please invest in the quality of teachers. We can have more wonderful human beings if we do that. I'm very proud of my family, and I'm so proud of the teachers that taught them throughout the years. So thank you, teachers. Hi, my name is Janet Mascalier. I am a teacher at Central. Um, I've been a teacher for 30 years, uh, 15 here in Belmont and 15 in Burlingame. Um, my husband and I also live here in the community for about 26 years. And we've raised our two boys um, here in the district through Central and Ralston. Super proud to be a member of this community. We couldn't ask for more. Um, so I'm going to say a few things. A, thank you for your work. I'm proud to be here where we don't have to worry about book banning or other nonsense that is all over. Um, it's not an issue I'm, as I buy my books for next year. So thank you for being normal and um, for keeping um, growth and progress a priority. Um, thanks for the barbecue last week. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we all deserve fair and equitable, equitable compensation for our work. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is about the mental and emotional health that we are struggling with. Um, as, we, as we've read over the, the past few years, the countless notices that went out about COVID, um, the safety and well-being of our staff and students is our primary concern. And um, I believe that, and I believe you all believe that. It has to include the, the mental and emotional well-being of our kids and our staff as well. I applaud the district's support of our counselors. Thank you, School Force. Um, our own counselor, Danielle Kim, Kim, is fantastic, and she has brought so much positive to our school. I'm hoping that the district can find funds to support a full-time counselor at each school site. It is invaluable. Um, we have been without a psychologist all year, and it is um, not okay. It's not okay. So I applaud what Paula was saying. We need to... Um, attract psychologists to come to our district. Um, the behavior challenges in our schools have grown exponentially over the past few years. I'm on our PBS team and I'm really proud of the work we've done. We know that these youngsters have special needs and their foundations have been rocky at home. We come every day with compassion and empathy and patience and we teach that to the other kids in the class. Um, that comes at a cost. And our administration has been really supportive, but the effect that these situations are having on our school community is nothing short of traumatizing. And I don't use that word lightly, is traumatizing. And our general ed kids are seeing that every day. And so it's becoming normal and it's not okay. It's not okay. Um, and it's not okay for us when we're dealing with these traumatic situations to then have to go and teach the other kids who deserve a grounded, healthy teacher, um, it's incredibly challenging to do that. Um, so I hope you support a full-time counselor and a psychologist um, at every school. That's it. <clears throat> oh, my voice stopped. Um, <laughs> my name is Allison Williams. Thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. I've been teaching in the Belmont Redwood Shore School District for over 25 years. I came to speak to you tonight to encourage the board to negotiate a fair contract for our teachers who work so hard to support the students in the district. As I thought about what I wanted to share with you tonight, what came to mind was the fact that every teacher I know is exhausted. Not just the usual end of the year kind of feeling, but real exhaustion. And it's been all year long. And I've heard that in my colleagues. And I wonder why, why are we all so exhausted? Teachers are working harder than ever. Many feel that they're asked to cover more and more curriculum while still trying to connect with and support each individual student in their class. In addition, we spend a great deal of time communicating with parents to ensure that we work as a team to support student success. 
Student behavior has definitely created additional challenges at every grade level. I teach TK, so I teach the little ones, but it's all the way up to through Ralston and Nesbitt and Tippett. I still say Ralston because there was only one middle school when I started. <laughs> we know the students were greatly impacted by the pandemic and teachers are not only trying to help students catch up academically, but also to develop the social skills they need to succeed and be happy. And as a TK teacher, that's what I do. I want them to be able to get along and be happy and be in a community. All of this takes a toll on the teacher's own mental health and morale. If the district wants to attract and retain excellent teachers, they need to provide a salary increase. The pressure of making ends meet in the Bay Area magnifies the stress teachers feel doing the job they love. In addition, they need to allow teachers to focus on teaching the students in their classrooms rather than increasing adjunct duties and extra tasks. We are professionals who deserve to be treated as such. And I wanna give another shout out to Danielle Kim. She's our counselor too, and she has provided incredible support, done social groups. We're gonna fight for her, I think, if she gets to be full-time at a school. But that program is making a big difference, but we need more. So thank you for your time. So Robin, before you go ahead and get started, can I get Jennifer O'Hara and Dawn Graves up? Okay, go ahead. Good evening, PRSSD board, PRSSD staff and community. This is my first time ever speaking, a little nervous. Um, my name is Robin Silk, and I am an SLP, speech language pathologist, ed specialist at the preschool. I don't know how many of you are familiar with our preschool, but it's a great place to be. Um, what I wanted to talk about, um, I have been in education a long time, 30 plus years, 12 of those years are here at your SSD. Um, and I would like to talk about the class sizes for our special ed programs. So class sizes, I don't know when they were negotiated, how, how long ago, but um, now the children we see in our classes have more intensive needs. Um, we're seeing a lot more autistic children in our rooms that need a lot more support. And class, class caps for our caseloads are 12 per class. Um, that can present a, a safety issue, especially in preschool, because we do have children that move very quickly. Um, and we, we, like Jenna, are seeing a lot of behavior. Um, we are also seeing that in our classrooms. And um, not all of our paras are trained to deal with that. That's one of the problems that makes it difficult for us in our classroom. Um, and just having children with such diverse and intensive needs, we're not always able to meet all of those needs. And that, that tears me apart as an educator because I want to be able to give every single child in my classroom the best start they can have. I'm their gate to the school age program. And I just wanna make sure I'm able to get as many of my children from where we are into a general ed program because that's the goal. We want our children to be with neurotypical peers. And um, oftentimes because of huger classes, it's just not a possibility. We work as hard as we can but you know, there, there are these, all these little bodies. Um, I love learning about new things. I love being an educator. Um, I love learning all about how to, how to support behavior in my room and to help other teachers support behavior in their room. I can't do it by myself, obviously. If any of you are like me, any of the board members, I wanna put it out there. I wanna invite you to come to preschool, see our program, see our kids, see what I'm talking about, and then reconsider uh, a, a class load cap for the classrooms. Also consider it for the other SDC classes because the, the, the demographic has changed since when I first started. Thank you so very much. Hi, I'm Jenny O'Hare. I'm a science teacher at Ralston, but I will be reading a statement on behalf of Megan Chides, who is a social studies teacher at Ralston. 
Um, so she is actually at home with her adorable toddler, Diego, right now. Um, my son, Diego, is the reason why I'm writing this statement to the board as we embark upon salary negotiations for the year. I'm a ninth year social studies teacher at Ralston, married to Jonathan, a 10th year teacher at Ralston. We love teaching here. The students are great, families are committed to education, and many of my colleagues have become dear friends. We are both club leaders, coaches, elective teachers, and have served as department leaders over our years at Ralston. In the years leading up to 2020, I appreciate that my salary was able to finance a shared one bedroom apartment with room for some savings and a wedding. Then in 2020, thanks to a down market and a low income assistance program, we were able to buy a condo in Half Moon Bay and Diego was born in 2021. We call ourselves likely, lucky to be in the position that we are in. We quickly realized that benefits for dependents are insufficient in comparison to single employees. We also had to face the difficult challenge for families that require two incomes to find an affordable daycare. Now over half of my monthly salary is going towards Diego's childcare and healthcare with the rest plus a portion of John's going to the mortgage, what's left over paying for the expenses. This is what it costs to raise a family in the Bay Area. Even two of our BRSSD salaries are becoming insufficient. Being a single subject upper grades teacher, I have wondered about teaching high school. The comparison of salary and benefits are as big of a pull as the opportunities in the classroom. Carlmont offers full healthcare coverage to dependents, has a partnership with an on-site daycare with discounted rates for teachers, and pays $15,000 more annually for my current education and experience levels. In the nine years I've been at Ralston, seven teachers have moved to Carlmont. This being said, for now, I'm still here. I love my job, but I want to have another child in the near future. I want to afford for them to participate in sports and clubs and eventually attend college. Five Ralston teachers have had or are having children in the past one and a half years. I am sure... I'm sure this is also true at other BRSSD schools. Please consider this population when considering how much of a raise the district has a budget for. I want to retire a Ralston Ram, but might not be able to afford to. Thank you. So Dawn, before you go ahead, can we get um, Adam and Facebook? I'm Dawn Graves. I am a legacy employee, if you will. My mother taught at Ralston Middle School for 30 plus years. I've been a teacher for 35. I have spent 24 of them at Ralston. My children were taught by Jim Yosha so they know how to speak. Because <laughs> they didn't. And, you know, we moved to Belmont so that our children could be educated in Belmont. My colleagues do not have that option, many of them, because they can't, they can't afford it. But the main thing that I want to talk about is safety. We can't blame COVID anymore because we've got what we've got. We can't go back and we can't fix our kids. We have to meet them where they are, which is something we're used to doing, but we don't know where they are. We don't, I'm not trained to deal with the mental health issues that I'm seeing in my classroom. And I am a certificated mental health first responder, but, I, but I'm not skilled enough to figure out how to meet these needs of these kids who are so disruptive in classrooms that they are denying their peers the opportunity to have an education because they can't learn, the teachers can't deliver that high quality with students who are intent on disrupting. Restorative justice does not work with them. They don't care. We need ways to address that. That affects our mental health. And when we are not okay, trust me, they're not okay. Because if I don't feel safe, and a lot of times I don't, I teach on the front of Ralston. I have clear windows. And how many times this month have we heard about people shot at school? 
this is me. I'm anxious. But we don't feel safe. The kids don't feel safe. And we need tools. We need to make sure that we have qualified healthcare professionals on our campuses so that when a child is hurt and has a split chin bone, that they know not to move that kid and risk severe damage. And we don't have those things. And if one of us got hurt, I do not feel confident. Thank you. I've been hearing a lot of parent complaints about you, just a lot of concerns. Now, I can't elaborate. I won't give you any guidance or clarity, and I won't tell you who spoke to me or what they said. Also, you can't trust each other. Some of you came to me privately to tell me a few things about the other. Wait, sorry, none of that's true. That's just how the principal at Ralston talks to us teachers. So now you have a feeling of what our work environment is like on a daily basis. My name is Rika Rain, and I'm a special education teacher at Ralston Middle School. I have a mild, moderate, multiple subjects credential with added authorization for autism, my cloud certification, over 20 years teaching experience, and a master's degree in special education. I'm also a proud Cipriani mom, although my serious concerns regarding how the special programs department here is run and the delays and denials in the child find process, both as a parent and a teacher, are a conversation for a different time. I'm not here to share the many ways that I've been personally mistreated and victimized as a disabled person by the administrative team at Ralston and here at the district office. And I'm not even here to share the names of my many coworkers who have also been bullied and maligned by the administration at Ralston. I'll let those who are willing put the target on the backs, their backs themselves. I'm here to express my concerns that our principal Sabrina Adler, someone who mistakes criticism for critique, has joined the BRSSD bargaining team and what that means for BRSSD's priorities. We teachers do need pay raises to keep up with the sky skyrocketing cost of living in this area. That's true. We teachers need and deserve to improve benefits as well. Our special programs personnel need smaller and more manageable caseloads yesterday. But we need work environments that foster our strengths as teachers, that help us work and grow together, and that show, that prove that we are safe, valued, and appreciated. The toxic environment at Ralston is unlike anything I've experienced since joining the district in 2008, and I've seen a lot, and I've always been proud to be a Ralston teacher. I remain unconvinced that our current administrators actually like teachers at all, and they've made their lack of respect for us abundantly and repeatedly clear, and they have no apparent regard for our safety or well-being. Ralston is a distinguished school and a national blue ribbon school, and that is entirely due to my re remarkable colleagues, who are some of the best that I've ever had the privilege to work alongside. But we now have an administrator who confuses insults with feedback, actively works to divide us and sow distrust, and mistakenly believes that finding the work in, worst in us will somehow motivate us. Her presence on the bargaining team has coincided um, with demands for increased teacher work hours on top of the ways that our work expectations have bloated over the years, and with finding ways to make it easier to get rid of exceptional teachers who disagree with her methods. A nationwide teaching crisis is no time to alienate your core workforce of experienced and qualified professionals, and California is the third most impacted state in the country in that shortage. It has been a very long few years, and we are all near the breaking point. We're not superhero heroes, we're very human, and we care deeply about what we do. I understand that new cheaper che teachers are cheaper and more malleable if you can find them. Untenured teachers don't have the voice to speak up or the security to join the collective voice. But our years of experience are worth every penny that you pay us. In fact, they're worth incalculably more. And chasing us away is a short-term plan. Do BRSSD parents really want to lose us all? Do they want our district scores to go down as we get replaced by an obedient but untrained workforce? The more we lose, the harder the job becomes, which can lead to a disastrous cascade of teachers escaping a sinking ship. Does the community at large want to watch their property values plummet because word spreads that BRSSD didn't do the work to keep the teachers with the most knowledge? We need you to work with us as we bargain for an updated and fair contract so that we can focus our considerable energies, talents, and expertise on supporting all of our children. Thank you. Last speaker for our comments, but remind the audience that your limit was three minutes and please recycle And Adam, before you get started, if you want to go ahead and stand up, Mary. <laughs> Yes, 
Okay, you're on. All right. Hello and good evening. My name is Adam Reitman and I'm a math teacher at Ralston Middle School. The purpose of my speech is to discuss a few topics under the umbrella of working conditions and retaining high quality experienced teachers. On a macro level, we all know there's a teacher shortage in California and in our country. It is in any district or school's best interest to ensure that teachers are happy and supported or else risk having to look for a needle in a haystack to find good teachers from a very limited or non-existent pool. Unfortunately, it feels the opposite is happening. I have been at Ralston for seven years now, and I've never seen the morale of the staff so low as it has been the last two years. Teachers are feeling targeted, scared, demoralized. Many teachers feel like we are walking on eggshells, like we have to watch our back, afraid of a gotcha moment. Much has been said about the mental health of students post pandemic, but that same grace is not afforded to teachers. I know many teachers don't feel valued as educators or professionals. I'm not just talking about a small group of teachers that are perceived as complainers. And I feel it's insulting that that's the, the word around the district and our school. Our climate survey, I'm sure, will show this. And I hope the district, office, and the board will take it to heart and really understand what teachers are feeling. I also wanted to express my concern about district priorities for how the hours clause in the contract. Reading that the expectation of the district administration is that we as teachers work extra unpaid IEP and 504 hours, and quote, in the best interest of students, is wrong. One, parents have a legal right to a certain amount of time off for school meetings. And secondly, you're just going to cause teachers to burn out and leave. That is not in the best interest of students. A couple final notes. One is that I'm frustrated by the policy of us having to go through two SST processes in order to get students tested. The SST process involves six weeks of observation for students and then to go through a second round, that's 12 weeks, that's a third of the school year before they can get their legal accommodations for learning differences. Even then, we have seen 504 language that is really meant for IEPs. This is all a money-saving delay tactic that is unacceptable. And I hope all parents know this is happening. It is not in the best interest of children. Don't forget too that salary is critical for morale as well. Don't forget that we have an award-winning schools due in large part to excellent experienced teachers. Don't forget that inflation is out of control. Finally, on a random note, since I am two months away from having a baby myself in my arms, I also wanted to point out that the cost of footsteps, thank you to Megan's uh, comments as well, $2,650 a month, that's $26,500 in a 10 month span. Is there really no help that the district can provide staff with young children? Ralston alone, as Jenny pointed out, and on behalf of Megan, has several babies in the last few years. I'm gonna be joining that party in two months. Not to mention the cost differential for healthcare for families versus couples. Can I just, I just I'm almost like two sentences. Please look within yourselves. Is your intention to support and retain teachers or is it to weed out teachers who advocate for the rights of student, colleagues and students? Please understand what the staff is genuinely feeling. Prioritize our mental health. Please don't push teachers away from this amazing district. Do what's actually best for students and teachers. Thank you. My name is Mary Hurley, and I'm embedded as an English teacher at Ralston. While I conduct research for my dissertation, which and the aim of my dissertation is how to bridge the gap between administrators and teachers. <laughs> okay, so I would like you guys to consider the national context, and that is that there is a teacher shortage and teachers are having this conversation with their boards and among themselves nationwide. So what do we do? Uh, I would ask you to consider the fact that teaching, as you know, is a pink collar job, underscored by the actual Secretary of Education Cardona just a couple months ago when he stated that if we would not be having this conversation if 76% of teachers were men, okay? So salary, absolutely. We are asked consistently to do non-teaching duties. That's because we're historically and actually currently still a pink collar job. We are trained professionals. In fact, roughly 43% of our teachers have master's degrees, unheard of in an elementary and middle school district, unheard of, 43% roughly. You can check that. And we are asked to do non-teaching duties. Count, compare that, for example, if you will, to pediatricians. Would pediatricians be asked to don a yellow vest and take their 
uh, their patients to the bus simply because those children came to see them in their doctor's office? Why are we? And if we re respond with, why are we doing this? We're considered uppity or who does she think she is? All socialization for being the nice lady who teaches. That keeps us in our box. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. It's a pink collar job. We are professionals, trained, experienced. We have credentials by the state. The state gives us their blessing to teach. Many of us have not only bachelors, but masters, as I mentioned. So the districts that are doing it right are listening to their teachers. They're shifting their model ever so slightly to have administrators engage with teachers, the actual experts too, to work on policy together. The core of my research is having teachers and administrators do this in several schools. My cycle one research, which was conducted in Ralston as well as seven other schools, came back with results, teachers saying that they felt isolated, devalued, and silenced. This was consistent. It's also consistent with extant research nationally. Lastly, Dolores Santoro, a leader in the research on teachers and a teacher herself originally, now a researcher, says that teachers may be burned out. And that is very important part of the dialogue nationally, but they are demoralized. Demoralized meaning they are separated from the good work of teaching. We don't get into teaching to be mean or to gain money. Sorry. Um, and so we need to be connected with our teaching. Thank you. Sorry to go over there. My name is Jack. I think I'm probably only the parent here. <laughs> the teacher. Yeah, uh, English is my third language. Sorry about that. If you cannot hear me clearly, please just ask me to repeat. I'm very happy to repeat. Uh, my wife and I, we moved to Belmont about 10 years ago and knowing about Belmont is a good school district. So we raised our kids here. Uh, my one daughter, 10 years old, another 12 years. Um, I want to express some kind of feeling or experience that we have uh, over the years. Uh, <clears throat> my son would be like, when we get enrolled in, uh, he's learning his difficulty. And then, so we try to do about more the volunteer, but we found out actually, uh, it's so difficult to be a volunteer in the school district. So uh, we ask other, ask other parents as well. And feedback, a lot of parents want to get involved uh, to volunteers, but we found out it's quite difficult or very limited area parents can help. So even, uh, I think that's one kind of thing I want to share about that. Um, the second thing about my daughter, so she was in Central from K to four. And right now, because of personal reason, we took her out for fifth grade out of school district. Now we want to enroll uh, in the Ralston. We found that there's no space for her. And then uh, we asked other parents who as well. We found that, oh, wow, this, this year, maybe there's too many kids, uh, very similar situation. So uh, yeah, just we don't know where we, should we end up with. So uh, as the parents, um, I think maybe only the white parents are here or maybe <laughs> represent the parents. So I would say, uh, we talked to a lot of parents. A lot of parents really want to get involved in the class or on other situations as well. Because my son was like, he was kind of forced going to, up fourth grade, kind of forced going to private school, the Catholic school nearby, because we are allowed to involve more, understand, uh, how my kids grow. Uh, we did a volunteer for sports, right? Just sitting, helping them bring the tools, something like that, right? Or lunchtime, helping the teacher to prepare the lunch, something like, like this. We understand about uh, public school have different rules, yeah. But I, when I talk to a lot of parents, a lot of parents really want to get involved to help. So, and then uh, I grew up in China. I mean, in China, Teachers have really high expectation, really high. We look up at teachers, look up at doctors, because we believe teachers are the, the guide, guide for the kids to grow for the future. We really honor and respect teachers. And then, uh, of course, I mean, parents always get help as well for the school. I just want to say, uh, to say just like, if possible, 
maybe a little bit more enrollment for sixth grade in Rostam. The second thing is that allow parents to help. There's a lot of parents who really, they really willing to help. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Last speaker is Finbar Lima. Is Lina, Lina, Lina. On, this, on the same topic or some different yeah. topic? Different topic. Also, we know. Yeah, my name is Finbar Lina. I'm a parent of the kid in, uh, in Roslyn Middle School. I'm also the soccer coach for the girls' team this year. First time we've been in conference for ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'm, you know, the way I'm looking at, at it is that there's a lot of money spent on soccer in this area. Parents are spending 10,000, 20,000 a year, no problem. You know, add it all up, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of parents or whatever, you know. It's as big as, as big for soccer as it is for basketball or volleyball, you name it or whatever. But it, tell me this, is anybody aware that there's a sinkhole in the <laughs> But I mean, hand up anybody who's aware of that. Yeah, but it seems a lot of people who aren't aware of it. Right, it's been there for two years. Yeah, does so anybody go jogging around it? No, a lot of the kids didn't either. It's pretty, pretty sad. You know, I've looked into it. Because I... Um, uh, just a bit of a disclosure, I'm also employed as an employee of Florida, uh, an employee, not as a staff member, a union member or anything like that. I'm also employed by Elmont Redwood Shore School District. Right. Now, the sinkhole is the responsibility, I've talked to Dan as well, you know, is sinkhole is the responsibility of Park and Rec, or is it the city, or is it the school district, or is it the school? or is it the parents, or is it the state government? This is where I'm at. This is where I'm at, or whatever. I want to get the sinkhole fixed. Is it an engineering problem? Is it a political will problem? When I started the job as coach, girls coach, or whatever, I spent five weeks, the first five weeks, trying to get, guess what? The grass cut <laughs> on the part that isn't affected. I, I eventually, you know, I, you know, and I tried to get alternative facilities, this, that, and the other. Brick wall, brick wall, brick wall. And this is what, I, this is what my issue is. We have a huge amount of resources. We're not a third world country. We have a huge amount of resources. Yeah. Yeah. We're locked up. Whether it's bureaucracy or what it is. We're not getting access to it. The community's not getting access to it. The children aren't getting access to it. The teachers aren't getting access to it. The, 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 the staff, the administrators aren't getting access to it. It's locked up. But for whatever reason, it's locked up. And it's, you know, we could get a donor. We could write a bond. What's the expression that Donald Trump said? You get a fat cat with a fat check. Right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Someone comes up with another check or whatever. We could get the Cunha family to help us out the way Half Moon Bay did. They've got, they've got half the amount of people we have. The property income is in the, in the area is a fraction of what ours is. They've got a fantastic... I like this. Your, your time is three minutes. Oh, sorry. They've got a fantastic time. facility. We don't. We don't. Is it the political will? Why don't we open up the, the facility or whatever so that the community gets involved, so that the parents get involved, save more money for the, everybody around, get the kids healthier, more involved in sports? Mr. Lena, you are at time. Um, however, that said, I Lina, do... Lina, Lina, Lina. Lina, my apologies. Yeah, yeah. Lina. Sure, no, no problem. Yeah. And in conclusion, thank you. I'm going to come here the next time. So. Thanks. Whatever. I'm going to ask the same question the next time. Somebody told me in the school, I up in the school, that it might be resolved. It's three minutes. Might be resolved by. It's unfair for to give you extra time that other people could. Well, well I can. I can see your first. Your comments. But, yeah, but I'd like to be fair to the children. 
Uh, Mr. Lina, I do have an update. I was going to share in my superintendent's update, okay, yeah. uh, but I will. Anyway, uh, winter or whatever, but anyway, I, soccer season starts next year. On give, give me an opportunity to provide you September. Updates. And then hopefully, 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 we have better response this year from the park and rec, the city, or whatever the school it is, or whatever. Grass cut and fix the sinkhole. You, you can put a perimeter Thank around you. the sinkhole and have the track operating so that we can all live healthier and happier. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Thank you much. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just uh, I was as part of my superintendent update, I was actually going to provide the board um, an update uh, about the sinkhole. Uh, so the first sinkhole appeared uh, last year, uh, was repaired. Uh, one sinkhole uh, is interesting. Uh, we, we took a look at it. We fixed it, uh, did an appropriate repair for the sinkhole. Uh, late uh, this fall, um, a second sinkhole appeared. Um, one is chance to uh, we need to investigate a little bit further. Uh, as part of our process, we actually did um, mapping of all the pipes. Uh, we sent cameras down the pipes uh, because we want to ensure that our students uh, are safe, our community is safe uh, when they're on our field, right? So um, we did that. I'm happy to report that the pipes that we, we scoped uh, were solid. Uh, we identified the singular pipe that goes into Water Dog Park that is made from corrugated metal, has a 30 life, 30 year lifespan. Um, I, I'm smiling because somebody's mom, who was it? Uh, John, your mom probably was there when that pipe was put in, right? Um, and uh, it, it um, has deteriorated over time, right? So uh, we uh, need to replace that pipe. Uh, that is a process. Uh, we've just completed the top uh, topographical study uh, that identifies slope, grading, all that those pieces. Uh, it actually called out some of the big oak trees uh, that have likely grown over the pipe and are crushing the pipe. Um, so in the process of fixing it, uh, we anticipate a, a, a completed scope of work um, by uh, likely the end of the year. Um, uh, June, June, July time frame. So we'll be coming back to school. Year. End of the school year. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Keep the word updated. Uh, Ms. Spellinger, are there any other speakers on non-afforded, uh, non-agenda items? No, there are not. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the board, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their very thoughtful comments. Um, Mr. DeGora, um, uh, I will note that uh, public comment on a period for non-agenda items is at a non-standard time. Uh, do you think we have any room for flexibility to allow speakers to address the board if they uh, unintentionally arrive at our standard time? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I think we should move on to our next agenda item at yeah. this point. Ms. Ellinger, if uh, somebody comes uh, for public comment on the previous topic, we will honor that. Just take a card and we'll work that out. Okay. okay. Uh, item number five, uh, approval of the agenda and consent agenda. Um, let's see if I can find that. Uh, are there any requested modifications to the agenda or consent agenda? There were no updates, Pre President Howard. Um, I will note that I will be reading the resolutions uh, for uh, uh, 5D and E during the superintendent comment. Okay. Um, seeing as there are no significant uh, requests for modifications. Uh, is there uh, a motion to adopt the agenda and consent agenda as presented? Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving on to our next agenda item, if I can find it. This is our public hearing. Yes. Great. Aye. Uh, Thank you, President Howard. Uh, as you'll recall, uh, our last meeting, uh, we adopted a resolution uh, moving us forward to uh, by trustee area uh, elections. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work on tonight's uh, consent agenda, the agreement to move forward with uh, redistricting partners uh, was approved. Uh, tonight, Paul Mitchell um, is joining us, is gonna provide us an overview 
of um, what is involved in the process. Uh, and it will be recommended once he completes that uh, to hold a public hearing regarding the composition of potential trustee voting areas, a pre-map public hearing. Okay. So the board will open the public hearing on uh, this topic uh, at 5.56 p.m. Paul? Oh. Thank you very much. And I believe you'll be forwarding the slides for me. Yes, I will. Great. Uh, first off, thanks for having us here today. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm the owner of a firm called Redistricting Partners. We're a firm that works primarily here in California um, around redistricting and CBRA conversion and analysis of voting rights issues and so on. Um, and uh, we've done over 100 redistrictings and CBRA conversions in just this state. We also are the demographer for the state of New York in their statewide and New York City redistricting. Have worked, we're working in Portland as well and other places around the country we've done work. Um, and we are also unique in among redistricting firms that we also work with the research community um, and universities and with Common Cause and ACLU and other groups in trying to advocate for redistricting reform uh, to try to make redistricting more fair and public oriented and less back room and, and political. So um, we're really happy to be a part of your process. Um, we've done a lot of redistricting in this area as well, um, in this county, uh, with cities and uh, other agencies all around here. So happy to be here. We'll just go through these slides real quick to go over what redistricting is, what the California Voting Rights Act is, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the things we'll cover are uh, the California Voting Rights Act, kind of a what is districting, You'll find that I talk about this process as redistricting, even though technically it is a first districting, there's no re in it, but it's just that that's kind of the common terminology. Uh, I'll talk about the Voting Rights Act. Uh, there's the California Voting Rights Act and then the Federal Voting Rights Act and California Voting Rights Act is really kind of a misnomer. Uh, it's mostly about conversion to district election system that doesn't take on the large scope of voting rights issues that the Federal Voting Rights Act does. Um, we'll talk about traditional redistricting principles and how redistricting works or should work. And then we're just going to dive in for a moment to talk about the population data and talk about your upcoming hearings. So if we can go to the next slide. So. The California Voting Rights Act is a state-based state law. Um, like I said, it doesn't cover the vast number of issues that are covered by the Federal Voting Rights Act, everything from how ballots are printed to where precincts go to how registration is done. And the California Voting Rights Act is narrowly tailored to looking at whether or not elections in at-large systems, which is a system that elects multiple representatives from the larger agency, um is allowed um or not and it bases that kind of test of whether or not it should be allowed on whether or not that agency has underneath it racially polarized voting and those are kind of there's a lot of definitions around what is at large and also what is racially polarized voting at the core racially polarized voting is voting patterns that can be identified based on racial composition of a precinct where if somebody were to come in here, they could literally, you could give them two candidates and give them the ethnic composition of those candidates or which you know, candidates are, are in a race and then tell them the ethnic composition of every precinct. And they could write a formula that describes the likely election outcome based on race. And in areas where you have that kind of voting pattern, you're not allowed anymore in California to have at large elections. And we've seen these cases come forward all throughout the county here and all throughout the state. And, um, you know, it's our uh, expectation that if you did do that kind of research, you would find, and we've done it in this area before, that there is racially polarized voting. So if we go to the next slide, the uh, key difference between the Federal Voting Rights Act and uh, the State Voting Rights Act is the Federal Voting Rights Act can also require you to go from at-large election systems to districted election systems, but there are higher tests. You have to be able to create majority and minority districts, and you have to be able to prove that the conversion to an election system will relieve a harm, that it'll actually create a different outcome. 
The California Voting Rights Act is neutral on that. You don't have to create majority minority districts to be required to go to districted system under the California Voting Rights Act. And there doesn't have to be some test or measure to say at the end of the day, it's going to create differences in the election system. It's just, do you have racially polarized voting? Oh, you do? Then you convert. There is a case in coming out of Santa Monica that was potentially going to be heard this June, but the Supreme Court didn't take it on, so they might hear it in September. They would look at that question of what is the harm we're trying to uh, get relief for and what is the expectation of you know, do they have to be majority minority or something like that? But that case is, you know, potentially even a year or more still out. So we go to the next slide. The one thing the California Voting Rights Act uh, got amended to do in the last decade was make it easier for you to convert. It used to be that if you said we want to do the right thing and we want to convert to the district election system, the state law didn't provide a pathway for you to do that yourselves. You literally had to say, we're going to convert, and then we're going to spend a million dollars on an election to get the voters to affirm our decision to convert the election system. It was really tough for a lot of agencies that wanted to convert. So first with the community colleges, we got a bill done to make it easier for them to convert through a waiver process. And now schools, uh, special districts, cities, everybody can convert as long as they follow a set process. And so we'll talk about that set process, but that's generally called the safe harbor provisions. Next slide. So it's important to talk about what this is going to do, what it's not going to do. Districting is going to set up the boundaries for your elections. What it's not going to do is determine what kids go to what schools. It's not going to determine what schools you're supposed to care about or what neighborhoods you're supposed to care about. You still can act in the interest of the district at large, but on election day, you'll be running for office just within that district and not be receiving votes from the rest of the agency. So it, it determines eligibility and voting. What it doesn't determine is how you have to act as a board. If we go to the next slide, and then I already said that, so we can go to the next slide. So Federal Voting Rights Act, it goes into the, there's two main provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act is the idea of majority minority districts. Um, and there are tests, the jingles tests that look at how uh, racially polarized voting might exist and how it would affect the requirement to go to majority minority districts. And then there's also something called Section 5 of the Federal Voting Rights Act that has to do with getting the federal government to sign off on your plan for redistricting. Uh, Section 5 will come up sometimes, but it was basically dismantled by the Supreme Court. And Section 5 didn't affect San Mateo County anyway, so it wouldn't have affected you even if there was Section 5. It affected Monterey County, affected Merced and Kings and Kern and Yuba, but it didn't affect... Uh, San Mateo. Um, if we go to the next slide. So to dive in a little bit more in case this comes up about the Federal Voting Rights Act, the Federal Voting Rights Act requires majority minority districts in certain cases. Doesn't require them all the time. But if uh, a minority population is sufficiently large, enough and concentrated enough that you can using like a normal looking district, not like a district that looks like, you know, an octopus doing yoga, you know, just like a normal looking district where, where 50% or more of the minority population can be put into one district, then you, that's the first test. Can you actually do it? The second test is, does that population in that area vote as a block? Do they generally vote in concert with each other? based on ethnic concerns or ethnic considerations. And then finally, is there a block of voters that is stopping them from electing their candidate of choice? Are they always trying to vote for this candidate, but then the white population is coming in and trumping that vote and voting for another candidate? So that's the idea that under Federal Voting Rights Act, if you do have a Section 2 district is what it's called, then that means that you have a district you can draw with reasonable redistricting principles and you have racially polarized voting. If that comes up, 
we might uh, seek legal counsel or get some interpretation if there are concerns about it. But you know, generally in this area, we have seen um, Asian majority minority districts, and we can look and see if that's possible. Um, and then in other parts of this region, you have had places where you could draw Latino majority minority districts, but I don't think you necessarily find that here. We go to the next slide. So when we draw districts, we are under the California Voting Rights Act supposed to look at the criteria in the federal in the Fair Maps Act. These are really kind of like good redistricting principles anyway. Um, but the way we're going to draw districts in this area is to first draw districts that are equally sized. Now, when I say that, I mean equal-ish. There's a buffer of, of roughly 10%. If we go to the next slide, I think there's a little screen that shows it. So if two areas are within, uh, you know, a small number within each other, you know, uh, the, there's a 10% range essentially from the highest to the lowest district and they're close enough, that would be considered equal. And you're gonna hear a term called deviation. Deviation is how far away a district is from being perfectly sized, if all districts were equally sized perfectly. There's also another term for, we call they use the same word deviation. Deviation can also mean the overall plan how much all the districts are away from each other uh, or from their median. And the way we calculate that is by looking at the district that's the most overpopulated and looking at the district that's the most underpopulated. And if the most overpopulated district is 4% over and the most underpopulated is 4% under, the sum of that or the, the absolute value, the sum of the absolute value is eight. So that's an 8% deviation. If it's two over, two under, that's four. Our goal is to stay under 10. That doesn't only mean five up, five down. It could mean that the largest overpopulated is eight over and the most underpopulated is two under. And you could still have that 10% total plan deviation. We're gonna draw districts that are contiguous, which is gonna mean that they don't hop or jump. Now, contiguous can mean two things. Like a lot of stuff in redistricting, you get in these definition issues. Contiguous can mean like I'm soaring above the area and I can see that it's all one shape without having like separate parts. But contiguous can also mean something is functionally contiguous. If I'm hovering above something and it's a whole thing, but through the middle of it is a, a river and a train track and a mountain, these two populations on either side aren't actually functionally contiguous. You can't like get from one to the other without going out of the district and back in. So we're gonna look at contiguity within the plans, not just about whether or not they are literally contiguous shapes, but also like, do they actually connect? Um, if we go to the next slide. This shows the idea of something like literally being not contiguous, but it's also about how things function and whether they're functional. So next slide. Here's an idea of contiguity. In this map, which was an actual redistricting plan that an agency tried to adopt, um, you have this purple district. It's not contiguous. It has separate disconnected parts that uh, don't meet up with each other. It might've made sense to the agency like, oh, well, this is all north of this one street, so we're gonna put them all in the same district. But from a redistricting perspective in the current state law, that wouldn't be a legal district, that purple district. We go to the next slide. This is a district where um, we have four really compact districts at the top. Davis, we did this one. Uh, four districts that are really compact at the top and you have this long, weird district at the bottom. And you think to yourself, well, why didn't you just draw five districts that are all kind of, you know, columns next to each other? Well, the problem is that that highlighted line is train tracks. And you can't cross the train tracks without getting or going around and outside the districts if you had four, five columns. So we ended up creating one district underneath these train tracks and then four above it. So the idea, this is actually a compact and contiguous district, but uh, it is 
shaped by that geographic boundary. Next slide. <laughs> so the other thing we're going to look at is maintaining communities of interest. Now, this is a pretty subjective criteria. Um, let's see the next slide if I have a thing. Yeah. So there are Voting Rights Act protected communities of interest like Black and Latino and Asian or language minorities or other groups that could be considered a community of interest in a Section 2 Federal Voting Rights Act criteria. But what we're really, really going to look for is communities of interest based on a couple things, or three things actually. Is this a community that you can name? It's the cycling community, it's the senior community, it's the you know community of where there are more students or there's a community that's more of a hillside community. What is it? It is a thing, okay? Is it something that is geographically defined? If you said, oh, 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 I've got a community of interest, left-handers, because they're always fighting for the armrest and, and you know they need the silly uh, can openers that are the other way. That's not a real community of interest in a redistricting perspective because they're not segregated to one part of town. They live everywhere. They're amongst us. <laughs> um, but the uh, but so you want to have identifiable, you want to have geographically, hopefully compact, like that they're actually more concentrated in one area than the other. And then the final one is that they relate to you and your governance and what you're doing as an agency. Uh, you might say, hey, Paul, there was a water district redistricting and there was this hillside community and that's a community of interest. But then we look and it's because in the water district, they pay a higher rate because they're on a hillside. And so they're a community of interest in the water district because they have a specific issue, but they might not be a community of interest in a school district redistricting. So we want to see things that have that connection to your policies. Let's go to the next slide. And we can go to the next slide. So this is the idea, the three things, group with shared culture, geographic nature, and a relationship to the agency and the policies. Next slide. Following easily understandable lines, this is kind of the part of redistricting where you say, oh, that makes sense to me. That looks like a district. And so you want to have things following and relying on natural or man-made boundaries or freeways or geographic boundaries based on you know, where cities are or other kinds of administrative lines. Next slide. Keeping districts compact. And compactness, I could give an hour long speech about the different mathematical formulas for compactness. Um, there's one formula of compactness of just putting a rubber band around it and measuring the rubber band around it relative to the external boundaries of the actual district lines. Um, there's in New Mexico, I think it was, you're not allowed to have silly looking districts. Um, but in California, we use a, a measure for compactness that you don't bypass nearby populations to get to a far away population. So if we're drawing a district and I were to draw a district that uh, went from me, went around Dan, and then captured the next group, we're bypassing Dan to get to a far away person. Right, that's not allowed in the redistricting. You need to get nearby populations and not go around a nearby population to get a far away population. Um, that's how the state law is written. Next slide. So again, what I was saying, there's things that are not compact with a bunch of different mathematical formulas and other things, but our compactness definition is really kind of simple. Next slide. Here's some examples of things that aren't compact. Um, this is actually on the left, city of Martinez. They're redistricting. See that turquoise looking district through the middle there and all of the districts are like these long, weird shapes. That was done because four council members lived within like 700 feet of each other. And so they had to draw all four council members in the same district. Well, we came in and we redistricted this city. And the next slide, That's what it looks like now. That's compact. That's not like some crazy gerrymander to just, you know, uh, achieve some other outcome. That's actually districts that make sense and are compact. So under the state law, the map on the right is compact enough. Map on the left is not compact. Next slide. 
Now, hmm. we're going to look just at your district. <laughs> now, your district shape is not, your district isn't necessarily compact to begin with, but necessary. <laughs> I mean, that's not the point. Um, uh, if we go to the next slide, we have data tables. Nobody can own the water. And I just wanted to go over the water. Things. The data tables here will show your population in two different counts, and they're different numbers, and I want to explain why, because you're going to see this for a, a while. The, um, the data table at the top is showing your population based on the decennial census after Berkeley's statewide database has adjusted it for a reallocation of prison population. If in a house down here, there was somebody who was arrested three years ago, they're in prison. The California Corrections uh, has given the statewide database the data to reallocate them back to the house where they were living before they were incarcerated so that the population in the state is more balanced based on that. And you're not having these things where like one neighborhood in Kern County has got you know, thousands of people uh, and they get more political representation because of all those people, but it's depriving other areas of political representation. So that rebalancing of prison population is the one adjustment to that top data set that is the total population of your district, which is just under 45,000. The breakdown underneath it is gonna show the ethnic populations of the district, which is 11.6% uh, uh, Latino, 33.7% Asian, 1.3% Black, and the remainder under an other category of 53.4, which is white, Alaskan Native, Hawaiian, um, and there might be some other really small populations there, but that's the primary what other is. It's primarily white, so just over 50% white. The second data table, if you scroll a little bit more, is this citizen voting age population. When we talk about voting rights, we're talking about people who are eligible voters. So we remove citizen, non-citizens, we remove kids from that data set, and we're looking here at that citizen voting age population, which is a Data that's put out by the census is required by the Federal Department of Justice so that you can enforce Voting Rights Act cases. In that calculation, the district is 59%, that other, which is white in other categories. It is 9.8% Latino. It is 29.7% Asian and 1.5% Black. When we get the final redistricting plans and all the plans that you're considering, there's gonna be columns for each district with those same population breakdowns in both of those categories. And if you go to the next slide, when you get your redistricting plans, you're gonna see each individual district is gonna have this kind of summary. And this summary shows the data in data tables for a little visual look. Um, it'll show the district within the overall agency in that lower right-hand corner and have that individual district's population data in both the totals and in the citizen voting age population. So uh, if we go to the next slide, this is where we're at, and this is following and actually exceeding the requirements of the uh, federal voting right of the California Voting Rights Act. So we are having a pre-map hearing. We're going to have the same presentation again on June fifteenth. It's going to give you another chance to hear me meander in topics of compactness and contiguity. And it's also going to give the public and anybody else who wants to come a little bit more information about how they can participate. Uh, we're going to have those first two meetings. And we're not going to talk about maps. We're not going to draw maps. We're going to listen. And we're going to let the public know what's going on. Then at the September 21st meeting, we're going to have draft maps. These draft maps, uh, we will probably provide some draft maps. We generally do three maps. But we will also look at what the public has done if we have any publicly drawn maps. I wouldn't recommend that you as, as members of the school board get involved in drawing maps, but the public should be involved in doing that. Um, if there are things that you want to see in the maps, if you say, hey, there's this real important community of interest I want to make sure it's protected, please tell us, put that on the record so that as draft maps are being created, we can start looking and considering that. Um, but we also want to have the public uh, submitting maps. There will be a tool the public can use online to draw maps. I think we're planning on having that mapping tool up before the June 15th date. That's what I think June 9th, I think, is when we're going to have that finally up. We talked with the vendor today just to make sure that's all on board after sending them a, a couple emails trying to get that going. Um, 
That September, September 21st hearing on draft maps will be an important meeting because it'll be the first time that a lot of the public gets to give feedback on actual maps. And usually that spikes the interest. That October 19th meeting, uh, we might try to do some online outreach meetings before that October 19th meeting and in between those draft map meetings. That October 19th meeting is kind of the most important meeting because at that October 19th meeting, you're going to take the maps that you've seen and you're going to select one to go forward to the November final meeting. That selection of a map is gonna allow for uh, your staff to put on the website, this is the map we're considering and have the public give any feedback. If you put that map up and come to that November meeting and feel good about it and adopt it, then you're done. If you come back and you say, wow, we heard from the public or you know, I have this new idea, we wanna change that map, great. Change the map, but then we have to schedule another meeting, make sure that map's been public for seven days, and then you can adopt that map. There's not gonna be any possibility for anybody to adopt a map that hasn't been public for seven days. So just a real quick summary, two pre-meetings just like this, one meeting where you get first introduction of maps, another meeting where you get to call those maps down and select a map that you're going to adopt then finally one hearing to adopt a map that's been public for seven days and that's the process and we hope that it allows the public to be engaged we hope that it has a lot of transparency and we hope that through this process you'll get maps that you know the community can really feel reflects uh the district so that's it thank you okay, thank you okay uh, miss ellinger are there any requests for public comment on this topic? No, there are not. So seeing as there are none, we will close uh, the hearing. Um, this public hearing at 6.22 p.m. And then I will open it up to the board discussion. Take it away. So thank you very much for this. Uh, so it's an enlightening uh, first time going through this, and I appreciate you giving the slide deck in advance. Um, just one question about like communities of interest, and I kind of understand there's like three criteria because going into this, I did feel maybe how I do agree could be subjective yeah. and open, right? So the data you shared was so my question is this: the data you shared was mostly some some race um, population. Where how do you I can see how that could be drawn from the census data. How do you get other communities of interest specifically? I guess another large one is around religion, Jewish communities, for example, who could very well be, you know, naturally living near temples or places of worship, but not necessarily, mm -hmm. right? So how do you factor in where are your input sources to help you, you know, get more clarity around, like you said, identifiable communities of interest outside of race and you know the geog geographical i can see geographical being a little bit more easy to spot yeah physical boundaries than like a jewish community or another religious community so there are a number of ways to do this and it's a uh, it is one of the more fun parts of redistricting because you really do get to learn more about communities um and first off we like to hear about the communities of interest from the public you are members of the public too, so you can bring up communities of interest that are important to you. But the idea is to get folks to talk about the thing, the communities of interest they think are important for this redistricting. There will be on the online mapping tool an ability to not just draw maps, but also draw communities of interest. So you can, in the mapping tool, go in and say, I wanna make selection of areas and I'm gonna draw uh, the Armenian church and the Armenian markets and where I think the Armenian community is. And you can draw that and have that be submitted as testimony as to where you believe the community of interest is. Then we can also look at data. So as an example for the Armenian community um, or the Jewish community, you can use surnames to identify populations. It's not perfect, but it is one of the tools that's been acceptable uh, and been used in redistricting. So when I was doing redistricting for city of LA or city of New York, having the Jewish community mapped with a heat map to show where they are based on surnames, and then also showing, you know, temples or other kind of, uh, um, you know, 
whether it was like with the Muslim community, the Armenian community, the Jewish community, the Chaldean community, showing kind of those uh, places that they might gather like a community center, those can be used to help define a community of interest. And so it's a combination of public members coming in and kind of saying, well, this is where the area is, community-based organizations. So like with Koreatown in LA, there were three different maps for Koreatown in LA. There was the city's map of what Koreatown was. There was the Koreatown Neighborhood Association. Then there was the, the uh, um, Korean American Association drew their own separate map based on how they believe that the areas changed. So, you know, working with all those kind of data to, to try to identify that. Then there's other things sometimes that you can find in the census. So if you said, well, as an example, we did a redistricting in uh, San Bernardino County where they wanted to look at educational rates, like educational completion rates. And it was for a community college redistricting, but uh, we did, we took from the census and mapped different educational attainment rates. You can map commuter areas by looking in the census at average drive times. So there are data sets where if somebody comes from the public and says, my concern is seniors, we could actually map where the what the median age is or where the most seniors are, and then provide that as a way for people to start to think about that community of interest. And it is one of the challenges in redistricting is um, there are so many potential communities of interest that we could have millions of different. I've mapped almond growers versus walnut growers <laughs> in a redistricting. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done all kinds of different communities of interest, people living near airports, people living near freeways, you know, uh, renters, homeowners, all that stuff, uh, student populations, all kinds of things. So the point of it, it would be that you listen to the community coming forward with their concerns about their community of interest, and then you try to figure out what data you can use to map it. Do you feel that, um, I know you're just in the, in, the, in the data collection standpoint, but do you feel that, do you have any early, um, early assessments of if Belmont is unique? I, I mean, we've, I've, it sounds like you, you've done work with other districts. So do you think Belmont characteristics seem to be unique either geographically or? Well, it is unique or, in that- Maybe there's some challenges. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, even in your name, you recognize that you have some Belmont and some Redwood, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like you do, you do have two cities. Mm -hmm. That's unique. Um, you do as a, as a geographic area have more urban downtowny, more hillsidey mm -hmm. kind of elements. You have areas where the homes are really densely populated and homes where they're more spread out. You have uh, transportation corridors. Those are the kind of things that you mind that might end up relying upon. You know, if we're drawing a district line and it's just another, you know, 100 people to go over and capture that freeway, then you might just want to use the freeway. It helps the district be easily identifiable. It might not be a community of interest per se, but it is a way to draw a line that relies upon existing structure. And also the people who live on one side of the freeway it's a little harder for them to get to the other side of the freeway. So it becomes a compactness thing too. So all that stuff gets balanced. Um, but yeah, those are the things that jump out, I think. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, in one of your slides, I'm not, I'm not numbers, uh, running rights section two. Yeah. Um, I want to believe you were just giving that to us as, as information about what the Voting Rights Act is. But as, like, as I also listen to you talking about districting here, is, is the goal to create communities of interest based on minority groups and their voting rate? Like, like yeah, 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 yeah. Are you, it's an important five question. Five of those, yeah. yeah. So there is this real challenge in redistricting where um, you can't draw districts that discriminate, right? right? But then if we had all the state's preeminent Voting Rights Act attorneys in the room, they'd also tell you you can't draw districts based on race. Right. It is this weird thing where we want to be cognizant of the impacts of potential districts on minority populations and ethnic populations. 
And if there is a potential majority minority district, that should get probably special consideration to make sure that we wouldn't do something purposefully to, do, to deteriorate that or to dilute that, right? right. Um, at the same time, if you said, hey, Paul, let's say we're talking, let's say we're in a different area and you say, hey, Paul, I want one more Latino district. That's not legal to do. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best examples I heard, one of the best metaphors I, I heard in this was uh, from a guy, Justin Levitt, who works in the White House now doing uh, Voting Rights Act work. And he said, think of the ethnic data here right. like a speedometer. Now, if you drove and never looked at your speedometer, you'd speed. I mean, trust me, driving here, I know that. So, uh, so you'd break the law if you don't look at your speedometer. But if all you did was stare at your speedometer when you're driving, you would crash, right? So speedometer is something that you have this cognizant, you're cognizant of it, you check it, you make sure you're not speeding or not what, you know, but you're not like overly focused on it. So um, when we do this, we'll have all the data tables for the ethnic population. And if there is a potential to create a district that's a majority minority district, we'll probably put a little note on that and probably say these three plans have a majority minority district, these two plans don't. But then at the end of the day, we not want to make sure that we're not drawing districts where we're just trying to like inch up the ethnic populations to the detriment of communities of interest or compactness or anything else. So we just we want to be cognizant, but we don't want to be, you know, overly focused on it. Um, my other question, looking at the dates for the meeting, just like literally on the last slide, is, is this is this now officially for the 23, for 2024? Yeah, so this would be in place for 2024. I, I should take a moment to emphasize two, two key points uh, that I keep reiterating. Uh, one is this process does not change the schools in which our kiddos attend. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change attendance boundaries. It doesn't change our enrollment uh, format. And two, it doesn't, uh, all board trustees uh, continue to serve their term uh, throughout. It doesn't change things midterm. Uh, once once uh, a trustee's term is over or is out, uh, then we uh, decide which which districts uh, have the vote uh, that year. Yeah. So we'll get through this when we do the actual districts um, and have maps. We're going to have recommended uh, numbering and election dates. The way to think about it is that you're redistricting. People think you redistrict in BAMO. You're in new districts. You're not. What's going to happen is you're going to redistrict. And in 2024, you're going to have two or three districts, depending on what you choose, come up for re-election. And from 2024 to 2026, you're going to have two or three board members that are elected by district, and the other two or three are going to be have still be representing the at-large districts that they were first elected in. Then in 2026, the other seats get elected, and now the whole board is in a districted system. Think about it as when you were elected in the at-large system, nothing we do administratively can go back and undo those votes. You serve the entire four years in that elected system, in that at-large system, and then the conversion to the new districts takes effect over two election cycles. This is maybe too granular. Does this board decide which districts get the vote? So if in two years, if however they're drawn, yeah, there's three unrepresented districts and two seats open. Which district so, votes? How but just tell me how many people are up for re-election in 24? Two. And then three in 26? So that's what's going to happen in this plan. But if it, theoretically we all live close together, which maybe maybe it's not yeah, the case. Yeah. And the way it's drawn, there's three unrepresented or four. How does that? So what would happen is in 2024, you're going to have a map and you're going to say these two seats are up in 2024 and these three seats are up in 2026. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to draw the maps based on all these principles and draw them the right way. When you're actually looking at the final map, you know where the districts you live in. You might know which districts other people live in. You might choose that like, hey, it makes more sense for that district that I live in to be up when I'm up coming out of office. So, you know, you associate the districts based on 24 and 26. We might not be able to do anything about two or three board members being in the same district at the end of the day. 
And then you have to make a decision about whether it comes up in 24 and 26. And it might come down to the fact that like, hey, I'm up in 24, you're up in 26. We don't know what to do. You know what City of San Mateo did? They flipped a coin. Yeah. They flipped a coin on assigning the last district because they couldn't decide. When you say you have to decide, you say we have to decide. You have to decide, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I will share our current board has uh, five trustees from Belmont. Uh, we don't have any uh, trustees from uh, Redwood City. So depending on how districts are drawn, yeah. uh, it's likely that we'll replace the uh, Redwood City side force. Don't my questions. Yeah. Thank you. And hey, questions are great. I love them. <laughs> Um, I have a que I have a question, and again, thank you very much for this very thorough presentation. Um, I was just looking at slide ten, especially. Um, so um, the redistricting criteria, um, and I wanted I wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit more to um, that these criteria are ranked. Oh yeah, perfect. So um, so like we talked about the communities of interest, and you've talked about um, you know following natural or man-made boundaries but um maybe if you could again talk a little bit about how the things that are higher up in the list yeah. get higher importance it's really important to understand this you have rank criteria but there's and there's two ways to think about it one is these are not perfectly ranked it's not like we start by drawing the absolute best equal size districts then we go to the next step okay we draw districts that are relatively equal size and we go to the next step, we draw make sure they're contiguous, we go to the next step. We, we have these things and they're ranked. Notice the last one is compact. So the first thing is these aren't perfectly ranked. These aren't perfectly ranked like that they supersede each other. And also that last criteria, if you as a board are voting on the final plan and you say, oh, you know, I'm gonna vote on plan C, only because it's the most compact and that's the only thing I care about. And I vote and the whole board votes. That could theoretically be a violation of the California, of the, of the State Fair Maps Act, because you're saying that that last criteria of compactness is more important than all the others. So when you articulate why you're adopting a plan, it's really good to just treat, you know, the equally sized and contiguous are just gonna be check boxes, right? It's really going to be important you talk about why you support a map because of those that next criteria, the communities of interest. And it's going to be really important that you understand that the compactness and how the map might look is less important than those other criteria. And if you have questions through the process, we can talk about it. Um, but they are ranked. And if, as an example, you said at the very end, oh, we want to add a new criteria. Cool. We want to add a criteria we've had this where um, no district has more than one school in it, let's say, or every district has a facility in it or something like that. We've had those kind of criteria discussed and you could add that as one additional criteria, but you can't supersede any of these criteria. You can't say, we're gonna create this new criteria, but then we're gonna bump it up here ahead of community of interest. And that's technically why you can't draw districts to preserve incumbency. Because in the in community of interest language, it says that incumbents are not a community of interest. <clears throat> Candidates incumbents are not a community of interest. So even if you said, we want to add the last criteria, we want to add a new criteria that all the incumbents are protected, great. But you can't supersede that other community of interest thing. So any community of interest in the area would supersede preserving the district for the incumbent. So, you know, it's kind of a backwards way of getting there, but that's why. Um, the current interpretation of the Fair Maps Act is you can't draw districts just to protect incumbents because of the ranking. Thank you. Uh -huh. they're, not, they're not a community. They're not. They're, they're not a community of interest, but the but the constituents can be. Sir, this is a. a yeah, I, I will clarify. Yeah, no, in, no incumbent or candidate or individual can be a community of interest. Yeah. yeah. Um. So presumably by the end of 2023, we'll have our maps drawn. We'll have five equal size, relatively areas. And of course we have to live with that for the next eight years. So it's very important to get this done right and make sure, you know, the right areas represented and um, and it's it's good for the long-term future. Um, so with that, it's important to get all the community feedback and find out like, you know, we, we have our ideas of communities of interest, but we wanna make sure that everyone is involved in that process and we get the information. Um, and, uh, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what the outreach 
plan is. If we have a plan in place, some timelines, some dates, what type of surveys we do, um, announcements, and maybe there's, um, I, I know most of that would fall on the district to do and not um, not, not you, uh, Mr. Mitchell, but. Sure. Dan, would you, would you yeah, uh, so we, we, we did hit the ground running pretty strong with outreach. Um, we uh, put notices and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Ellinger, uh, we have a notice coming up in the, the pilot uh, for the June meeting. Uh, we ran, uh, we released, we did a press release that was sent to a daily journal. I'm not sure if it made it in there or not. Uh, we did run our public uh, hearing notice in those venues. Um, we will continue uh, to, to promote uh, these sessions uh, to the greatest extent practical. Um, when I was speaking with um, uh, Paul, uh, we talked about um, once we've released the redistrictor um, piece, the map drawing software, that there's probably an opportunity to hope for us to host uh, a Zoom meeting that allows us to demonstrate how to use that. Uh, we can we can video that um, and push that out as well. Um, and then I would invite um, us to think about uh, as a board um, maybe naming. Uh, a, a, couple of board members and non-majority uh to work closely with me and in, in, in doing that that piece yeah i think one of the critical things is we want to make sure everyone's aware that it's happening which is it's i think the word is going out but then we don't want to get in december and people say hey wait what this yeah. doesn't work out for me and you know we want to make sure that everyone's fully aware and and and, and we've uh we have uh i i did send an email to both uh to both of our city city um uh council folks uh to give them that heads up as well and fortunately since um the city of belmont just went through this last year and redwood city went three or four years ago i think and last year they redistricted last year oh yeah because they the version like we district district distri if i get it right we we districted they redistricted uh yeah they redistricted yeah. uh yeah <laughs> we, we conducted both belmont and redwood city's processes so the, the, I think the residents of Belmont probably are aware of this process. A lot of them are and familiar with it. Um, I, did, I was able to talk to some of the city council, Belmont city council members and get their feedback. And um, yeah, they were, they recommended making sure we get the community feedback. Um, but they said the community was generally accepting of the process and was aware of the folks that did get involved. You know, there was um, not a lot of conflict. I mean, people gave their input and things went re relatively smoothly. Um, and your firm represented the city of Belmont in this process as well. Okay, so you have probably have a lot of that data. Um, but as to your idea, Dan, of, of um, having board members, um, Mr. Mitchell, I know you are the data expert. You can pull data from everywhere. I know you do this. You know that's that's your life. Um, so I know that you have all this data, but um, you know data can only show so much stuff. You really have to live here for many many years to understand. It's like, oh, that's that neighborhood. That's so yeah, as much information as we can give you um, would be great. And and Superintendent Gara, I'd you know I'd like to see two of the members. Um, you know, as you as we go through the summer, as you have questions or anything, you know, make sure that we can be a resource to provide you any nuances that that data is not going to perform or present to you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Hold on. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Apologies. <laughs> so, Paul. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, thank the uh, board for their comments. That um, what I what I learned is that there's an interest in transparency. I learned there's an interest in making sure that the public uh, and ourselves understand the process, and that uh, there is equitable representation on the board throughout the district. Um, the two questions I have for you, Paul, is that um, what happens if a district doesn't fill? A seat. Uh, is there standard language around uh, or processes around uh, appointments uh, that have been well accepted? Um, and other question um, is related to the Davis map. Uh, Make me think of the um, uh, communities of interest. Uh, knowing that area very well, uh, what I noticed is that there are two districts on the map that uh, have a. Can we see the map. Oh. It's on uh, number 15 uh, that have uh, quite a few itinerants. Um, would, would it be expected to have quite a few itinerants? Um, 
residents, uh, meaning folks that are there for maybe four years. And then another uh, district that uh, has been the one where the socioeconomic status is mm -hmm. quite high. Uh, so are those factors that, are those things that we factor in when we're thinking about how we draw this one? Yeah. Um, I think the more important, and you were talking about the more higher income parts of the city and yes. the Davis redistricting. I think the more important part was that lower income, that one district along the other side of the, the freeway, the other side of the railroad tracks. Um, that South Davis hadn't elected a council member uh, in decades, <laughs> and there had not been a council member who'd been a renter before. Um, and that's where most of the renter population is. So in that redistricting, we did look at student population. Um, unfortunately, in the redistricting, the student population was really affected by the census data being really bad around universities. Yep. Um, but we did look at that. We obviously looked at uh, the downtown core in that yellow district. We looked at the South Davis with the renters when we, this is when we first converted it. Um, and then uh, the rest of it kind of came down to the population equality, you know, the where you do have little squiggly lines. There were some weird census block shapes that we had to deal with. This. Um, but trying to draw those districts to be equally shaped. So, yeah, those are the kind of things that you can consider if you have uh, unhoused population larger in some part of this of the area. If you have um, areas with more kids, you know, um, and state law basically says identify communities of interest and place them in individual districts to maximize their voting and representative power. So that's a lot. What that means is if you can identify something, you want to place it in a district so that its voice is louder both at these meetings and also in the elections. Um, what you're not allowed to do in the state law, which some people have tried to do in the past, is say, hey, there's this, there's this unhoused population. We want all the city council members to care about it. So we're gonna split it into five pieces. And what that really does is it ensures none of the city council members care about it because it becomes kind of too small in their district to really have an impact. So you've seen things throughout the state and country where like you have a city and the downtown area and everybody splits the downtown area and you wonder why the downtown doesn't get the resources. It's because their political bases are out here on the perimeters and the downtown area is split up. So identify the communities of interest. You don't split them up so that everybody gets a piece keep them compact and preserve them within one district so that those areas have more voting power and representative power. I have one more. Uh, oh, yeah. Can you just, uh, the uh, uh, process around appointments at the- Yeah, so that is state law. Um, and it's different by agencies. And I try not to, uh, I, I'm not an expert in that as much, but generally it's an appointment process, I think. Do you- I, I believe that is the case. We'll make sure we consult with CSBA okay. okay. on that. Yeah, can you have one more question? Uh, just you said whatever we decide, we're stuck with for, for, for eight years. I'm still sitting with that. <laughs> Is it possible that redistricting just unearths the need to redistrict? Like you, you create groups you thought and you realize it becomes block voting or it leads of interest that are either being overrepresented or underrepresented. And then are you actually still stuck with it? Then it just becomes a voting rights act violation or can you pivot? Yeah. So um Generally, mid-decade redistrictings are frowned upon. <laughs> They're um, not allowed for cities and counties under the Fair Maps Act. If and when there's a state law that would extend the Fair Maps Act to school districts, that you have to follow all the Fair Maps Act requirements, both in your CVRA conversions and redistricting. Um, if the Fair Maps Act does get extended to school districts, you wouldn't be allowed to do a mid-decade redistricting. Um, generally, what you draw, you're, you're, you're left with for the remainder of the decade, so until 2032. <laughs> I want to thank the board for that robust discussion. Thank you so much, Paul, for right. your information. Uh, we'll look forward to your future presentations and uh, our outreach and all those other things. The next one's going to be just like this one, so don't get too excited. <laughs> We're going to hear these terms all over again, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the uh, agenda. Uh, I'm wondering if we should. Uh, uh, think about a five minute break around after item nine, since we have some speakers here from Fox, uh, and then uh, move on 789 and then basically take a little break. Let's be fair. Um, if, if there's someone here to speak to an agenda item, I recommend that we put it 
after the superintendent's report? Sure. Eight nine. Nine. Okay. Uh, so uh, on item number seven, uh, Board of Trustees report, and I think uh, Mr. Bruno, this is your time to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I don't know if it's May. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I've been working with a lot of people and attending a lot of, uh, of conferences actually recently and preparing for trips around the world um, and hosting um, kind of learning sessions at, at, at schools and witnessing them. So I'm going to want to recognize um, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I want to recognize Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, Mother's Day, like education, is just full of mothers, right? And so, <laughs> so it is, right? We it came up earlier, but there's a lot of that. And so... Um, yeah, yay moms. Uh, um, one of the things I'm currently kind of sitting with the most, and, and I think we heard about it earlier, is uh, I went to a, a children's health council, which is it's a, a session specifically about children's mental health, and it also led into talking about teachers and their mental health relative to that, whether it is is dealing with the, the, the aftermath of working with kids so much or just the concern that they care, that they have for them and how much they ingest and take in. Um, and so thinking about students and what they're learning, SEL programming, we, we, we presented on it at the last board meeting and um, we're kind of looking at what, what partnerships like for that at, uh, at their institutional, organizational and, and personal level. Um, yeah, and, 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 and footsteps came up and I um, got to see some kids yesterday. So I'm sitting with uh, just enjoying the melodies of, of four to seven year olds um, poorly singing. It was great. That's my bit. Uh, in Northern. Thank you. Um, so I was just looking back at my calendar uh, to see uh, different things that have been going on. Um, so I was happy to be able to uh, be an MC at the Celebrate the Music Festival. Uh, special thanks to School Force and all members of the committee who put that on. It's such a great community event and way for uh, our students to showcase their talents and their hard work. Um, and then also I was very happy to be able to um, be at the staff appreciation barbecue that the district staff held for staff throughout all of the sites. Uh, and that was great. And again, really appreciate all the teachers and staff for everything they do. And um, that, that's about it. Thank you. Well, I was able to attend a few brown bag lunches. Um, this is both with uh, teacher groups, uh, teacher lunches, and also with student lunches. I was going to talk a little bit about the uh, some of the comments I heard from teachers, but I think we already heard those today, so I won't. <laughs> I'll skip over that one. Um, but the student brown bag lunches, these are really a wonderful experience. Um, um, uh, Superintendent DeGuard does a fantastic job facilitating getting the kids to talk about what's on their mind and. I mean, kids don't have any filters anyway. They just say what's on, <laughs> and the free pizza helps too. Mm. Um, but but he did a great job. Um, um, a couple of the issues we talked about was uh, one was safety, and do and and while well, we went over some of the youth truth survey answers, and we said, okay, here's here's the youth truth survey, and here's what the um, 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 percentile is for the nation, for the state, and for BRSSD. And then we said, here's how we rank uh, among in these three categories. Um, safety was one of them that was ranked very high. When we asked the students, they feel relatively safe, they understood what it, it means to be safe. And, and one question I asked the kids was, if you have something, a personal issue, and something that's, that, that you need to talk to someone about, do you feel you have an adult in this, in the, on the school site that you feel comfortable talking with. And almost all the kids raised their hand right away. They're very confident there. There were a couple that didn't. I'm curious why there were a couple of kids who didn't, but the vast majority of them felt like they had someone to talk to. So I thought that was something I wanted to share that, that was, was a good um, uh, part of the discussion. The other big topic we talked about was the Youth Truth survey question. Um, does classwork make you, does classwork make you think? Um, that could be read a few different ways. We wanted to dig into it with kids. Now, when we looked at the Youth Truth Survey, I think we ranked down near like 10%, 10, 
the 10th percentile among, um, you know, does classwork make you think? And that's a little bit concerned. That's one of the only ones that was very low on the scale, I think. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to dig into that. Um, what's interesting is I went to the Nesbitt with the Nesbitt students and went to Ralston Roth, students. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how similar the answers for these two separate groups were um, for this. So it, it shows it's not site specific, mm -hmm. it's district wide. It's a good representation of what we're thinking. thinking. Um, so here's some quotes that I heard from the kids that I wanted to share with the board. Um, so work is, you know, does it make, does class work uh, make you think? Um, so one student said, work is easy, so we don't really need to think about it. I was like, we already, you know, we know it already. Um, and then some of them said, teachers do stuff on screens and students copy, which doesn't take a lot of thinking. Um, there's enough repetition that once we get to the, the quiz, the test, we already knew the answer. So we don't have to think about it because they've already learned it earlier on, which is, I think, a good answer. Um, a lot of tasks don't involve thinking. Projects involve more thinking. Um, class gets boring without projects and when there are a lot of, and when there's a lot of worksheets and study. So those are some of the, the what kids are thinking and why that score may have been in the 10th percentile. It depends how you read that, that question. Um, another thing that kids demonstrated was a strong desire of doing like projects, engineering projects, lab work, and they say, that makes things interesting. It makes me stay engaged and it's more fun, right? So, and they think there's more thinking when you have to do project work. And that was enlightening there. Um, and they they gave a lot of testimonials to teachers who say, well, this teacher does this or that teacher does that. And this is really something that makes me think in class. So they had a lot of accolades for the teachers and the great work that uh, they are doing in the district. Um, but uh, just to wrap it up, my favorite quote of the day when we were talking about something, um, one of the kids says, well, my dad uses chat GBT. So <laughs> no, I don't know where that's going to go. But anyway, it was an interesting comment. So it shows that the kid, that our children are watching and learning from us. So we need to choose, make our choices wisely for what we do. Um, <laughs> I echo um, Ms. Northrup's um, uh, comments about Celebrate the Music. Great community event. It's great to see everyone there. The um, turnout was was like um, pre-pandemic, so it, it's good that people uh, are out and makes them feel um, comfortable about being together. And it's good to get that community because because being stuck inside for so long. But it's good to sign more beyond that. Um, and that's my report. Okay, thank you, Sam. Mr. Cost. Thank you, President Um This has been an amazing month where for community. I, I think that the whole year. It's not that we just have community one month. I really feel in our all our school sites, certainly at Nesbitt, our, my kids' school site, it's a very vibrant community. And, and it's so great to have this, the community we had, um, in addition, obviously, as a, as a district community, celebrate the music, which was a privilege to hear Carl Mott and that, those amazing students there. But also multicultural night at Nesbitt, really, just brought a real big smile to my face. I know um, President Howard was there, but Trustee Bruno was there. And from the aspect of just the amazing talent, but not only the amazing talent, the ability, the, the community sharing um, from, from the poster boards to, to, the, to the cuisine, to the cultural food, to the presentations, um, <clears throat> were, it was really mind, mind blowing. And it was really, just a very uh, um, amazing thing to see, and uh, not only from a learning aspect, but just from an embracing and inclusive aspect and just the diverse body that we have. So I think it, it goes well with what we're going to do as a district to make sure that we continue to have these representations. But I would just also really also like to showcase the Special Olympics that was on May 5th at Nesbitt, um, because that represented the district and 17 amazing student athletes participated in it. A very big shout out to the Nesbitt um, teachers and as well as the adoptive PE teachers um, for, for putting that on, certainly uh, sponsored by Nesbitt PTA, Opening Doors PTA. But one of the things was that I thought was a very nice touch was having the second graders um, be the cheering kind of squad and then the eighth graders just volunteering their support and it was nice to be there and see the athletes and the smiles as they went from 
uh, you know, from station to station. Um, I didn't wasn't able to catch all of it, but I did catch a decent amount. And it was just that warmth and just again seeing the the other students kind of going alongside and really you could tell the the empathy was there and 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 just the inclusiveness of everybody, the cheering their fellow students on. Um, and it was just, I hope that continues in our district. Um, and then I guess finally, I just wanted to, one last kind of message that it's nice to slow down as we kind of reach these end of year celebrations, whether it's grade level, school site. And I just, to celebrate these milestones of our students and, their, and acknowledge their accomplishments, because I think sometimes, I know I do in my regular work life, you go through, you, you look forward to something and it goes so fast. So it's nice just to take a moment, pause and slow down. And then you really recognize how much has really been truly accomplished this school year and how much these kiddos have done and how much the families have been in support of, of the accomplishments both on the learning and, and like social emotional level. And so I just think um, I'm looking forward to being a part of some of those celebrations. I think we should just take a pause and really kind of also slow down to really celebrate the successes that we've had this school year. Okay, well, um, uh, very similar thoughts. Uh, I uh, got to spend some time down at Redwood Shores uh, this last week. And um, again, impressed by uh, the culture of the staff. Um, their uh, strong interest in doing the best uh, they can for their students and um, their willingness to express some of their challenges and share those out with us. Uh, that was really helpful. Uh, the uh, other thing I got to do at Ridwood Shores was go to their science night. And uh, this is the first time they've ever done it. It was a lot of trifold uh, presentations. And kids from, you know, second, first grade all the way up to fifth grade doing really interesting projects, some more informational and some uh, more, more experimental. Um, but regardless of the content, the enthusiasm of the students to present their work and share out their work and explain how they did various things. And as Sam was saying, in a very like open way, sometimes things blurted out that I think their parents are like, no, you know, um, but, uh, you know, they just give the best answers. Um, and so that was, I think it was great to see. It was great to see the spirit down at Redwood Shores. It also reminded me that um, it just takes a handful of dedicated parents to um, try to build community events like that. It seems like it's too much um, in there. Um, but you're just making stone soup, right? It's, it's, uh, it's getting together. It's having a good time, enjoying each other's uh, company. And realizing that it doesn't have to be perfect for a, a, a nice get together and, you know, arranging mm -hmm. times for each other just to be in a relaxed environment. Um, we got to go to the um, two by two with Sequoia Union not too long ago. And that was quite helpful. Um, it's always helpful to um, now meet with their new leadership um, and to uh, gain the wisdom of more experienced uh, school, board, school board members uh, from another district. Um, I was very um, grateful to uh, carry for her um, wisdom, especially as we move towards redistricting or districting, I guess <laughs> is what we would say. Um, a lot of insight there. Um, and then also, you know, some good discussions around um, how to deal with our traffic issues um, as our school start signs. Um, Coalesce. Um, the uh, brown bags, again, uh, are ongoing. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate the uh, teacher comments and the uh, um, students as well. Um, and I think I will uh, also would like to recognize our bargaining groups that are working through uh, both on both ends, you know, whether it's the, the uh, union's bargaining group or the district and the approach that they're taking about. Um, uh, interest-based bargaining and being open with their interests and getting working towards those solutions uh, sooner rather than later, um, knowing that we don't have uh, perfect resources, but um, certainly um, trying to do the best we can with the resources that we have for our uh, staff and um, employees. Uh, 
Uh, so I would uh, echo all of the, the things that you shared, uh, lots of stuff happening. Uh, the million days of May, as they say, um, but but in these million days of May, uh, taking time to stop and recognize uh, the great things that are happening. I will just say uh, the student brown bags have been a highlight for me. Um, it's uh, Sam got gets to see saw to see me in my element. Um, it's really connecting with kids, and and uh, they're often the ones that nobody asks how things are going. Right, and uh, we serve um, our students. So uh, our people are at the heart of the work that we do. Um, so I'm going to spend the bulk of my time recognizing four of our retirees. Um, the board approved um, resolutions as for our tradition uh, for four individuals, two certificated, two classified. Uh, I hope uh, they're watching on YouTube, uh, but I want to take a moment to read resolution 20A. Uh, commending Laura Giannini. Uh, whereas Laura Giannini has announced her retirement from Belmont Redwood Shore School District, whereas Laura spent her career at Belmont Redwood Shore School District, both Nesbitt and Redwood Shores Elementary School, as a kindergarten, first grade, second grade teacher, ending her career at Redwood Shores Elementary School in second grade, whereas Laura helped countless children learn about their own family histories through researching, storytelling, and writing with multicultural projects and celebrations, whereas Laura led and supported parent volunteers in organizing several assemblies so that the whole school would benefit from academic enrichment, creativity, and joy, whereas Laura shared her love of poetry with her students with mon monthly poem books and numerous opportunities for children to share their voices and their ideas through written and verbal expression. Whereas Laura demonstrated her care and compassion for children by frequently checking in with students after recess and talking through any conflicts that occurred. Whereas Laura thoughtfully supported, encouraged, and inspired her students by creating an inclusive environment for all. She fully included students who are English language learners as well as students with various learning, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. She differentiated her instruction, monitored progress, and targeted student areas of need. And uh, be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shore School District of, uh, Board of Trustees hereby commends Laura Giannini with over 27 years of dedicated service to the students, staff, and community of the district and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling retirement. Uh, congratulations, Laura. Um, our second uh, resolution is commending Carolyn Marinaro, whereas Carolyn Marinaro has announced her retirement from the Belmont Redwood Shore School District, whereas Carolyn spent her career at the Belmont Redwood Shore School District as both a first and third grade teacher at Sandpiper Elementary School, whereas Carolyn is an accomplished cook of many Italian dishes. Whereas Carolyn has spent the, uh, Carolyn has the largest classroom library most teachers have ever seen. Whereas Carolyn taught her more than 470, 75 students, Italian language chants and phrases. Whereas Carolyn has a passion for Australian television series, uh, which she can watch from Calabria, Calabria, where uh, she will spend half of her time. Whereas Carolyn is and always will be a beloved member of the Sandpiper family. And be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shores School District Board of Trustees hereby commends Carolyn, Carolyn Marinaro with over 18 years of dedicated service to the students, staff, and community of the district and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling retirement. Congratulations, Carolyn. Third resolution is commending Nanette Mayer. Oh, whereas Nanette Mayer has announced her retirement from Belmont Redwood Shore School District, whereas Nanette spent her career in several positions at the Belmont Redwood in, at Belmont Redwood Shores, including a general education paraeducator and inclusion paraeducator, and ending her career 
as the library media specialist at both Central and Cipriani schools, whereas Nanette has tirelessly worked to ensure all our students have books reflecting their diversity of cultures, language, and thinking so that our students see themselves as the heroes of their own stories, whereas Nanette provides students with a welcoming, beautiful space to grow their love of reading, whereas Nanette uh, is, a, is a creative problem solver who develops solutions rather than focusing on challenges, whereas Nanette has inspired students of all abilities to discover their passion for reading, whereas Nanette is a creative problem solver who develops solutions rather than, than focusing on challenges, be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shores uh, School District Board of Trustees hereby commends Nanette Mayor with over 17 years of dedicated service to the students, staff, and community of the district, and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling re retirement. I'd like to thank. And our final resolution 21B is commending Lisa Marin. Whereas Lisa Marin has announced her retirement from the Belmont Redwood Shore School District, whereas Lisa spent her career at the Belmont Redwood Shores school district as an inclusion paraeducator and then an SDC educator working at Fox, Redwood Shores, and Nesbitt schools. Whereas Lisa is a dedicated and kind paraeducator, she deeply cares for the children and goes above and beyond to make sure they are fully included in a safe, engaging, responsive school experience. Whereas Lisa is valued and honored by her colleagues, Lisa has built strong relationships with the Nesbitt community. She is reliable and trustworthy. Whereas Lisa has been a cornerstone of support in Nesbitt's special day class, she is collaborative, flexible, and always willing to do what it takes for the sake of a child in need. Whereas Lisa will be deeply missed by Mrs. Fernandez, her fellow coworkers, and the entire Nesbitt staff. Whereas Lisa will always be regarded as an exceptional paraeducator and be it further resolved that the Belmont Redwood Shores School District Board of Trustees hereby commends Lisa Marin with nearly 15 years of dedicated service to the students, staff, and community of the district and wishes her a well-deserved, rewarding, and fulfilling retirement. Congratulations, Lisa. Okay, uh, Ms. Ellinger, do we have any other uh, speakers on non-agenda items? No, we do not. Okay, uh, then I would finally like to move on to <laughs> item number nine, which is an information item presented by Fox School. I'm very excited to be here tonight to share a bit about amazing Fox Elementary. Next slide. There's no clicker, right? Okay. Oh, there was. Oh, okay. it's over down, down on the ground in the corner there. There we go. Oh, there we go. There you are, Taya. <laughs> so joining me tonight is Taya, who's our student council president, and she'll talk a little bit. And then they also have some wonderful staff that came out as well. Maybe we didn't actually turn it. Okay, that's right. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so as you all know, um, Fox Elementary was a recipient this year of the California Distinguished School Award. And then a couple years ago, we were also recognized as a Blue Ribbon School. But next slide. Um, something we're really proud of at Fox is our strong academics. And so this is just a little bit of an overview or a past cast data. So based on last year's data, 81% of our students either met or exceeded standard in ELA. And I was really proud of the growth that was made specifically for those that are exceeding standards. So we had 6% growth in students that exceeded standard for ELA. And then you'll see that in math, we have a pretty close match with 86% meeting or exceeding standard and a 5% growth of students that have exceeded standard. So our hope is to obviously keep that trend growing and growing. Okay, next slide, please.
It's not progressive. It's just try it. So as a new principal at the school this year, there were three goals that I really wanted to work on over the course of the year. And so the first goal was to foster a culture of learning and growth among staff so that we can best support our students. Second thing was to provide a positive and nurturing environment to support the development of the whole child. And the last one was to establish strong relationships with the community. And so we'll take a closer look at the first goal. So this year, staff attended over 12 hours of PD in various areas of interest. And so some staff went to some trainings on making math equitable. We also had on-site training focused on phonics work, focused on small group work. Some of our teachers went to off-site PDs as well, such as our kindergarten group that went to a specific institute for California kindergarten educators. And then after staff attended the training, there was time that was dedicated for staff collaboration, as well as time in our staff meetings where staff were able to highlight or share any of their new learning so that really we could build capacity and leadership across our whole school site. And I should go to the next slide. We also did a lot of learning and reimagining of our positive behavior and intervention system. And so my PBIS team went to a training in Sacramento that's held for California uh, PBIS schools. And so one of the big changes we made was to change it from in the past, we would say, I am safe, I am respectful, I am responsible as our core values. And one of the big takeaways from the team that went to the training was really switching that to more inclusive language. And so now you'll see on all of our logos that we're talking about how we are safe, we are respectful, we are responsible, and we are Fox. We also reimagine our reward system. And so those are the little tickets that you can see in the bucket that kids get, we call them caught being good. So anytime we see them exemplifying any of our core values, staff will give it out to them. People who are supporting at recess are also giving them out to students as well. And so students collect their tickets, they put them in their classroom bucket, and then there's different ways that we're recognizing students who are caught being good. And so every week there's a drawing done at the classroom level. We also started doing student of the month. So if you come and visited our school site, you'll see that there's pictures of all the students of the month in the front office. And then we also have a school-wide goal, which is to reach where you see kind of where that purple tape is on that container right there every month all the classes dump in their caught being good tickets and so once we go over the green they're the purple tape then we have a school-wide celebration so we'll have extra recess or something like that so just providing a lot of ways to reward students for showing our core value and making positive choices for our community and then the last thing that the PBIS team and I worked on this year was really updating our school-wide expectations and so we took what already existed and thought about how we can pare it down and really make it simple and easy for kids and so these are the expectations of what do we expect in the classroom in the common areas when you're walking in the hallways. And so each area of our school site has about three to four expectations with new posters that we put up so that hopefully it would be easy for the kids to remember and something that would transfer across all grade levels. And so I did wanna highlight some of the youth truth data in particular related to staff development. And so the teal color was last year's data and then the purple was from this year. So I was really pleased, my background being in professional development, but it was really well received by the staff. So you can see a lot of the staff felt that the professional development helped them to better meet the needs of their students. It really aligned with what they were hoping to do at the school site as well. Next slide. And then another important part, I think, of professional development is also providing feedback to staff so they can continue to grow. So most staff members, 86%, felt like they received regular feedback to support them in their classroom. And then I do have one area of growth that I'm showing as well. I was a little bummed that only 32% felt like they received regular feedback from their colleagues. So that is an area that we'll work on next year. I put it in my SIPSA goals and allocated funds for us to do more instructional rounds so that we're building capacity from within as well. And so our second goal for the school year was to provide a positive and nurturing environment to support the development of the whole child. 
And so we were really fortunate to have an absolutely amazing long-term sub counselor that was covering our sub who was out on maternity leave. So her name is Eileen Bragman, and she was absolutely phenomenal and made such an incredible difference, even though she was only at our site part-time. And so she would do bi-monthly lessons in classrooms tied not only to our social emotional curriculum, but if teachers went to her explaining this is a struggle that I'm seeing in my classroom, she would find a book or develop an activity and go into the classroom to really be responsive to the needs of the teachers. She also provided one-on-one -on -one support to students. As she got to know students, she also formed small groups where students could support each other who had specific social emotional needs in common. She was also always out at recess and lunch, helping with any peer conflict and resolution. And again, just really getting to know students. And I, I've never had a counselor that did parent support. And so she was amazing in knowing all of the supports that are available in the community as well. So if there was something happening with a kid, she oftentimes would bring the parents in and then hook them up with community resources as well, which I personally just learned a lot from her in terms of what we're able to offer our families to kind of extend the service out the school day and really support them as a whole unit. <laughs> Next slide. And then to talk a little bit more about um, the student experience, Taya is going to share a little bit more from her perspective. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Taya. I'm the student body president, and I'm really excited to share the fantastic learning um, environment and fun activities uh, at our school. So let's start with the exciting projects and activities that we have throughout the year. Um, in TK and kindergarten, we have sensory motor activities every Friday. Parent volunteers set up amazing uh, mazes, ball pits, climbing activities, and much more. Uh, my brother in kindergarten absolutely loves this and uh, looks forward to it every week. Um, also from kindergarten to second grade, we uh, raise pets um, and class pets like chicks, pails, cloths, bugs, and much more. Uh, it's wonderful because we can allow, it allows us to observe these animals from up close and uh, really understand their life cycle. Um, this year, our fourth graders put on a very special play called uh, Gold Dust or Bust. Uh, it's about the gold rush and it both was entertaining and educational and the students enjoyed being part of the experience um, while studying the historical time period. And as a fifth grader myself, uh, we focused a lot this year on colonial Americans and their daily lives. And so we celebrated a colonial day, dressing up like colonial Americans and um, experiencing a day without technology and we did fascinating <laughs> projects where we uh, learned where we learned tasks like turning um, butter crocheting and uh, writing with quilts um, box box elementary also organizes fantastic school-wide events uh, today for example we had Fox field day where each class participated in various outdoor activities grouped by colors uh, it was a fun field day definitely um, we also have uh, engaging assembly, assemblies, such as fun biking so showcases, visits from zoologists with their animals. Um, these, uh, these assemblies provide a break from regular schoolwork and allow us to interact with the presenters, which is really cool. Um, also, we have something special at Fox that not a lot of other schools do, uh, called Fox Travaganza. This has been a tradition for the last 34 years. And it's our annual stage performance where we get to part where we get to be a part of the real production and uh, each grade has its own dance there's a combined chorus with all students from different age groups and uh, we even have solo performers uh, duo performers and small groups it's a lot of fun and we truly feel the excitement of being on stage um last um our school also has a wonderful program called buddies it pairs up younger students and older students who meet once or more twice uh, a month to do fun project or assist each other with schoolwork. Uh, buddies give a younger students a glimpse of older grades and offer support during challenging times. Oh. Lastly, I wanted to mention our student council. It plays a vital role in representing all students, ensuring everyone's voice is heard. Um, we create surveys. We created surveys at the beginning of the year called Fox Favorites to gather ideas from students. Um, we also started a lunch Lego club where students could come and come together to build and participate in fun challenges. But the best part is that it's completely student. 
Um, additionally, we organized a Halloween house at the beginning of the year uh, for students to explore. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> for students to explore in their costumes and then they receive a prize at the end. Um, and currently we're working on a recycling project, collecting aluminum cans and uh, to sell and planning a school-wide board. And these are just a few things that makes our school so unique. And so just taking a closer look at our Youth Truth data for student relationships. And so the data point on the left is from students and the one on the right is from our parent community. And so 92% um, of students at our site feel like teachers really want them to do their best, which I think is just a true testament to the amazing educators that we have at Fox. And then you can see on the right that based on the parent data, that they feel that teachers and students care a lot about each other. Next one. And then I also just wanted to highlight some other quotes from students that was in the Youth Truth data as well. And so you can see a fourth grader said, my class shows respect by being kind and respectful to others. And it sometimes makes me feel like a family. And then another fourth grader said, I like about school is the math, reading and writing, the class material, but I also enjoy my teacher and my friends because they're very supportive and kind. And so the last goal that we worked on this year was re-strengthening our relationships with the community and allowing me to form new relationships with the community. And so we've been really fortunate to have a really active and amazing PTA and parent community at Fox. And so one thing we did this year is we created lunch clubs. And so you can see there's different options available to students throughout the week. And this is all led by parents. So on Monday, we have a parent volunteer that works in the garden. On Tuesday, we have parents that come in and open up an art room and lead art activities. Thursday, we have another parent that comes in and does board games. And then as Taya said on Friday, student council leads a Lego club. And so not only can students go out to the field and play, but those who are not super athletic or may not want to be out on the field always have an indoor option of something they can do during lunchtime as well, which wouldn't be possible without our strong community engagement. And then these are just some of the amazing events that we've jointly done with our PTA this year. And so they had a fabulous back to school barbecue. You can see on the right, that's like a snapshot from Fox Travaganza that they recently had. Um, coming up this weekend, we have our ice cream social. And I know we currently have like 330 people that have RSVP'd. So <laughs> quite a few people turn out um, for the events, which is really nice. And I think it goes to kind of what you all were saying and coming out of COVID. I think people are finally really coming back and really excited to engage in all these events. And so I think it's really nice that we're able to provide a lot for the community. And then one other initiative that we took on this year was partnering with Project Cornerstone. And so Project Cornerstone comes out of the Silicon Valley YMCA, and it's a social emotional program that relies on parent volunteers. And so we had over 30 parents in our community volunteer to be part of this SEL parent initiative. And so what they did is once a month, they would go into classrooms to read books that had an SEL focus. And so the focus for this whole year was on inclusiveness. And then there's two parents that were in charge of training. So they would train the parents on the book. They were provided a lesson plan and then some choices of activities. And so you can see a picture on the top left is from a TK classroom. And then the other pictures are just from other lessons that were done inside the classroom. And so it tied into the work that we were doing with our adopted SEL curriculum, but also again, tied to the community and bringing in families to speak in the classroom. And then we also provided a training for our community as well from Project Cornerstone on developmental assets. And so one of the things that they shared was that one of the most important factors in a student's success is feeling that they have adults in their life who care about them outside their immediate family. And so I think that's a second benefit of Project Cornerstone as well, is that parents are leading these lessons about social emotional learning with students and leading these discussions, allowing kids to feel a connection to someone outside their family as well. And so this was the data from our community partnerships, and this is the data we got from the parent survey. And so 76% of our community feel engaged with the school, which I think is an incredible number, but I still would love it to grow and be higher. And then 94% of our community felt that the school creates a friendly environment. And then in thinking about where we're headed, 
Um, starting about midway through the year, we did a lot of reflection on why we became teachers. What do we love about teaching? What's important to us about teaching? And then we took all that information that was gathered from a staff meeting and the leadership team looked at it and we came up with like three big pillars of what's really valued at our school site. And so the things that came out of that was belonging, independence, and engagement. And we decided to focus on one of them next year and then another one in the subsequent two years. And so next year we'll be focusing really on how we can make sure that all students feel a strong sense of belonging at our school site. And so you can see, we started doing a little bit of that work, thinking about the environment and the academics, but really that'll be one of our big pushes um, for next year. And that's all I have, so thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy. <clears throat> yeah, would any uh, members of the board like to ask some questions? Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for taking the long, strenuous journey down in district. <laughs> right. it was hard. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for both for the presentation. Very well done. Um, uh, a couple questions. I saw that you had one slide you're saying PD was 12 hours. Um, I'm curious, and maybe this is a question for Superintendent Gar, but how does 12 hours, is that standard or is that, how does that rank among other schools, this county, the state, the nation? Uh, good, good question. How it ranks. So uh, we have uh, called me if I, 180 school days. We have 185. The five or four, Julie. 185 teacher work days. Uh, three, uh, two of those days are the beginning of school. Uh, uh, two of them are professional development uh, in the middle of the school year, and then one is a float day that can be used um, either. Uh, uh, to close the year or to start the year. And then we have some Wednesday professional development uh, that's uh, scheduled throughout the year. It's it's a, a blend of, of uh, site-based, district-based professional development and uh, teacher planning uh, time and teacher collaboration time on those uh, Wednesday minimum days. And, um, I'm not sure how you calculate your 12 hours, yeah. but it's a combination it's within a, that. It's all those, and then I know it, different school sites as well. A lot of times we contract with staff developers or outside providers. So in addition to what's allotted in the calendar, there's also professional development that would take place during the school day. And we get like a roving sub so that staff could work with a staff developer or they could even like go into the classroom and model when students are there. Well, my question is more is like, you know, we're doing 12 hours here, but what happens in Santa Clara County? What happens in a different school day? It all depends on your contract. Uh, some some uh, teachers have longer contracts uh, than uh, than other districts. Um, it 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 uh, varies widely uh, from district to district, and and how they're allocated. And along that varying scale, where do you think? Or we're at the high end, or the low end, or the middle? Uh, probably not have a value judgment. I could say that I think investing in professional development um, is an important thing. Um, you know, helping um, our educators continue to grow um, and working side by side with them in that growth process uh, is is pretty critical. Uh, I'd love I'd like to have more, but we're working within our constraints. <laughs> and I think it's important just touching on it too when you think of the time span, like a lot more. At least when I look at planning, it is I, I would like to have something every month. But I'd also like to be a little heavier in the start of the year because that's when they'll have the time to implement. So I would hope to at least, and I feel like we've been able to, and I think at the other school sites I've been in the district as well, at least offer something once a month, if not more, so that teachers are able to learn something, but also then collaborate and implement it in their classrooms. Hmm. Yeah, the reason I'm asking, I think it's so important mm -hmm. not only to that individual professional development, but the collaboration too, where teachers can talk to each other yeah. and, and learn off everyone's experience. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and then also one of the things I appreciate is that you picked like three distinct goals and you focused in on those in different areas. So uh, it, was, it was nice to see how you did that. And I'm curious, so that was for this year. Are you going to continue these same three goals for next year? Do you have a process where you're going to pick? Um, so I, I guess we have slight similar, well, Yes, I want to always, I guess, 
PD is something that's like really dear to my heart. So PD is always going to be something that I'll value and try to bring. I think it's really important. And I think if we really want to close the achievement gap, that PD to me is like the key to doing that. Um, when I think about my goals for next year, yes, I want to continue working with the community. Like Project Cornerstone is something we're going to bring back and we're actually going to grow it a little bit and have a specific TK kinder program as well as one for the older grades. But I've also been thinking about just how like the belonging piece is something that's really important. And I think coming out of COVID and making sure that that SEL component and there's a strong sense of belonging is important. And something else I'd like to focus on next year as well is helping students with executive functioning skills. I think that's something as well that I wrote into one of my SIPs of goals is just really supporting kids with those skills, because I think that'll increase learning time if we can increase their executive functioning skills. Excellent. Very timely. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the answers. Of course. Any other questions? Uh, there there no questions? Yes. Um, I appreciate the inclusive language. You keep saying we. Uh, <laughs> you say our goals. Is that something co-created with your staff, with students? Is it just something you're passionate about? Um, so it comes in conjunction, right? Like I might share some of my thinking. We'll look at some of our data. Initially, usually I'll talk to the leadership team about it and then take it to the general staff. And so like I posted my thoughts for our like sips of goals in the staff lounge. What's my plan after the leadership team looked at it to allow everyone to have feedback because I think everyone needs buy-in in order for it to be successful. I just interject for a colleague real quick. The fact that she has staff doing 12 hours of PD, in addition to what's already in the calendar through sub-release, through weekends, through traveling to other states to different opportunities, is not just a testament to her leadership, but to the staff. Because they had to be willing to write sub-plans, to be out of the classroom, to get that professional learning, to get on an airplane and go to another state. We, I mean, we've, we've had a lot of different options at Fox this year through their collective planning, and it really is a highlight to the entire team mm -hmm. that I don't want her to just I don't I don't want us to miss that piece it's, it's huge on her leadership okay. uh on slide 11 I don't know if you know like 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 the ones before showed us past is that do you know if that's is that up or down is that an improvement are those numbers or is that just an um so I know the feedback from post <laughs> supervisors is an improvement the other one was a bit of a decline in all honesty like we didn't do yeah. um, instructional rounds this year so I wasn't surprised by it but I was excited to see and just in talking to people about their desire for it. like another staff member even had the idea to like put up a poster of like things I'd love to see and then like someone could sign up and be like oh I can host you in my classroom so we've been having those ideas and I think there's an interest and a desire to do it. Okay. Um, same question, slide 24. Just, just out of curiosity. Oh, I don't remember. I feel like those remained um, steady. They might have grown slightly, but I, it wasn't something that like jumps out as a, as a drastic change. Okay. Last well, thing I'm thinking of a number between zero and a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> you get it right, you can help my brownie griddle. <laughs> is this, is this on, on her performance and her staff's hard work and dedication? I say a thousand. <laughs> I feel like if I tune in, I'm going to start with like 700. Straight face poker face. Gotta keep it like. <laughs> 762. Wow. I feel like that would stay. <laughs> yeah. Something else. Sure. What was his partner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any uh, questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Um, Talia, thank you very much. And Pia, thank you. You did an amazing job. A very good speaker. Um, can you go back to slide 10? There was, it was a, it's a, I have a data question and then kind of. Right. So, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> That's helpful. 
So there's a kind of a, well, there, there's not so much of a drop off now that I look at it, but I'm just curious as to when you say school, yeah, so school encourages me, mm -hmm. but, but then um, the school, then it kind of, kind of dips down and provides me. So is there a way to, to that, okay, the school encourages me, mm -hmm. supports me, but is the reality maybe it could be encouraging, but yet not, not able either through timing or whatever to be able to, to do the implementation part. So how, how does that um, purple on the far right, like how do you interpret that? How, how do you interpret that? Last question. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of my teachers who teach specialist, like resource teacher, um, my science teacher, I think it was probably some of my parent educators might, I think those who are not my core from like when I dove deeper into the data, those, I got some feedback that it didn't particularly meet the content area they taught. So like mm -hmm. I didn't have music professional development, for example. And so that's just something for me to be aware of. And also honestly, like music with some of the specialists who work collectively across all the school mm -hmm. sites since we share specialists, but most of the one that I read more about those that felt like they didn't have something to tackle particularly for their students' needs was around that. There was also a strong desire for more professional development to around like tricky, handling tricky kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's something we'll try and do next year as well. Like I've talked to the county behaviorist who's going to come out towards the beginning of the year to do some work with the staff and give us some like skills and strategies to support that. Um, they, so going back to the, the counselor, I, I actually had an opportunity to meet her with Dan at the, one of the brown bag lunches. And, and she had, I could just see the, the vibrant energy. So can you explain? So she was there to fulfill like a kind of a backfill? Or, or... Right. So my counselor um, who was there previously went out on maternity leave in November. So I guess her, you know, and it can maybe came with her experience and her own personal desires to include that parent support. But I feel like those are just great and amazing initiatives. Right. Is there a way to kind of codify that or keep that going kind of built in because it's kind of like once you're used to it as a box community i'm sure the parents would like to have some like continue as a best practice or is it just really that individual or is there a way to kind of so typically a lot of that work is done by a social worker in all honesty in my past experience a lot of that more like wraparound community support a social worker will support with she is going to overlap i will have a new counselor that's starting that i'm lucky enough that they're going to get to overlap for two weeks so she can like in part <laughs> everything she did mm -hmm. hopefully and this new person brings a lot of wonderful things like she has a lot of experience with doing trainings around executive functioning so I'm really excited for that but I'm hoping she can talk to the new counselor as well kind of how she went about supporting families and what she did so that some of that can continue and I know the new counselor is also from the area as well so she's probably familiar with some of these extra supports that are available too. Thank you one, one last quick question on your three pillars, the the one of independence, mm -hmm. um, is that kind of a, a independence for staff or is it independence for students? For students. That's right. But yeah. how would that, when you're brainstorming now, and I know maybe it's an early time to do be doing that, but what? how does that kind of, can you think of some ways that you might want to implement like independence? Is that kind of like leadership mirroring or trying to teach leadership schools skills to the fifth graders or let them like what what do you what are some of your thoughts i mean i can tell you my thoughts we haven't dove, we haven't got into it as a staff like when i think about the independent piece i think about like in the classroom am i independent am i getting if i need paper if i need a resource that i know i can locate in the classroom am i getting it if I'm struggling with work, am I trying to independently solve it or use my resources? Like, am I checking in possibly with a friend if that happens to me, how the classroom is set up? Like, am I trying to do things for myself before I'm going to seek support um, from the teacher? I also think it's about like um, kind of understanding a little bit more like who, who am I like as a person to help build kind of some of that self-confidence and that their own independence. But 
again, that's like, but I mean, I'll talk with staff about it. I'll talk with students too. Like, what does this mean to you? And like, how can we help support you with independence? Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Amazing, amazing work. And thank you very much for sharing all of the great work that student government is doing. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions at this time either, but I do want to thank uh, Talia. Um, uh, feels like you were the right hire for that job. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, especially want to uh, uh, thank and appreciate the uh, Thank you. Uh, you have some of the most polished public speaking yeah. skills I've ever seen <laughs> for someone in the fifth grade, let alone the twelfth grade, let alone perhaps some of the board members here. <laughs> I, I am impressed and amazed, and I can't imagine that you don't make your parents very proud. Thank you. I'm just echoing President Howard. Uh, you've had an amazing first year, Talia. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, I want to say super thank you to, to our staff here tonight. Yeah. Um, it shows that we're building that community and that we're really coming together in support of our kiddos. And you get the trophy tonight. <laughs> Definitely the highlight uh, by far already. And, and I'm sure for the entire meeting. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, I know there's some Fox staff here and some parents as well. I really do want to thank you guys for everything that you're doing for that site. I know that you guys go above and beyond. Um, and I know you personally, and I'm very thankful to you guys. Okay. Uh, I think we have one more agenda item. I personally can get through one more agenda item before my back teeth start floating. <laughs> uh, so let's try to move on to agenda item number 10, if unless there's an objection. Um, this is an information item school, or not, I'm sorry, this is the parcel tax oversight committee report and information item. Thank you so much. I am not as good a public speaker as that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will all have to bear with me. Um, my first time. So again, please bear with me. My name is Dan Hardman. I've been serving on the parcel tax oversight committee since at least 2019, judging by my uh, email correspondence with uh, the former the former uh, chief business officer. Um, my role initially started because I was an at large uh, business member, and my role shifted in the last, I think meeting or two because I have uh, twin girls who are at Ralston. They are now sixth graders. So I fulfilled a, uh, a slightly different role on the parcel tax committee. And then um, last meeting was my first meeting as the chair. So um, I'm not sure uh, what, what else, um, whether I should take questions or whether you guys would like to hear just kind of uh, an overview of the actions that we've taken. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah yes to all. <laughs> yes, to yes to the latter is fine. Like an overview. Right. Uh, overview and um, kind of very quickly, um, uh, we met uh, three times since I, I think the last report, uh, the first on October 3rd, the second on February 6th, and then most recently on May 1st. Um, our meetings are, are generally relatively straightforward. We conduct a number of reviews and analyses, primarily focused on variance analysis relative to uh, budget and historical trends. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I would note the district is anticipated to receive 2.1 million from Measure R and 1.4 million from Measure K. And our findings were that the funds received from Measure R and K were in accordance with the stated purpose of the parcel tax to support A, teachers, B, technology, and C, libraries. Are there any questions that I can answer? Any questions? Out, uh, let's start with people. Uh, good to see you, Dan, especially in person. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for um, stepping up as the chair and thank you for your years of work on the oversight committee and to the other to the other members as well. Thank you. Thank you for your service. 
Thanks. That was that was all. <laughs> Sandy had a question or something. Um, First of all, I just want to take a quick moment to remember John Violet, who was his former former chairperson mm -hmm. of the committee. Um, remember his service that he did for that, and as well as sitting as a board member. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, do you feel that the district has provided you and the committee enough data to make an accurate judgment of whether the money's been spent wisely? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. And then, um, <laughs> as far as um, the committee members, I know we're recruiting some new members. Um, can how are we doing on on filling all the seats? And do you feel that there's a, appropriate diversity of community representation to to the oversight of the funds? Yes. Um, in short, we have five of six roles filled. Um, I believe that we're still recruiting for one. Um, I think that there is a good amount of diversity on. Uh, the board in general. I think it's always very hard to find people who live both within the community as as is required and who fit into some of the other kind of narrow range. So I think you, like me, you've seen people switch from role to role as roles become open and as there might be relevant candidates who are willing to serve. That's kind of, it's also a key thing. People need to be willing to serve um and who also fit kind of the narrow definitions so i know that our um the role currently open is for kind of the at-large business community member um you know if there were another Boston parent who were willing to serve i could see myself transitioning back to that role um but again that i think that's one of the key elements you know people a need to be willing to serve it, you know it's not a huge time commitment um, but it is a time commitment. And uh, despite the fact that we've been virtual, you know, we receive the packets in advance that are uh, no doubt take a lot of work. And then those need to be reviewed. Um, and then the meeting themselves take place. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking your time out of your personal schedule to, to provide this Absolutely. oversight. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Seeing as there are not, Dan, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Happy thank to you, do Dan. Thanks so much. Okay, um, I uh, suggest that we move to a five minute recess uh, or so uh, to, uh, you know, do what we need to do. <laughs>
Okay, um, I call this meeting back in session at 8.30 p.m. We'll move on to item number 11, which is uh, informational item strategic plan updates. Great. Well, welcome back, all. Uh, so uh, tonight's update uh, is our first read of our strategic plan. Uh, I want to start by just uh, recognizing Gilbert and thanking him uh, for his work uh, through Living Strategy as well as uh, Lana, who's not with us today. Uh, she's uh, attending a graduation for her daughter. Um, back East, right, Gilbert? It's city. It's, it's, perfect. So uh, uh, tonight's uh, a conversation will be really an update on the process, where we are, what we've been through. Uh, I'll share with uh, the board um, our um, overarching framework. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes uh, discussing, uh, providing feedback, on that framework. Uh, Kirsten, if you can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, and then finally, I'll share kind of our next steps where I see us going between tonight's meeting, uh, June meeting, um, and then beyond. Next slide, please. It's been quite a progress, right? We started uh, this pro project last August. We're in uh, phase four of five where we're synthesizing um, our work. Um, we uh, tonight have a draft uh, plan for the board to review. Uh, lots of wordsmithing uh, has been happening. Uh, we've been kind of checking it uh, against our, our gut initiatives and making sure that um, it aligns with our work. Um, and we think we have a really strong strategic plan in front of us. Again, tonight we're going to be uh, looking at uh, uh, trying to get a final uh, round of feedback on that. Um, and then we'll move into the May and June flight, finalizing our plan. Um, and then communicating it um, outwards. Uh, next slide, please. Again, up, upcoming uh, milestones. Uh, June 8th, uh, we'll take all the feedback that we have tonight, um, integrate it into the plan in meaningful ways, uh, make sure it gets to the board uh, around the June 8th timeframe uh, so that you can consider that final draft for June uh, 15th. Next slide, please. So thinking about the strategic plan and kind of the framework for discussion, um, I think it's kind of important that we're really clear um, about what we're looking at tonight in terms of the framework for the plan, and then how we'll uh, build that framework into really specific initiatives that drive those goals um, as we move forward. So kind of an overview here, you see um, those um, uh, uh, implementation roadmaps. Um, I shared a draft of the implementation uh, roadmaps uh, with you earlier. Uh, there's links here uh, for the community to see. But within each of our framework initiatives, we actually build out um, strategy that gets us one step closer uh, to, to uh, meeting those goals. Uh, those are in draft form. Uh, those will continue to be in draft form. Uh, until we finalize the strategic plan and then until we move into next year. So uh, lots of opportunities still for feedback on those, um, uh, but the, the focus tonight is, is on uh, the framework itself. Next slide, please. Uh, so before you tonight is, is Vision uh, 2026, uh, working together, creating our future. I'm gonna just stop for a moment there. Uh, there's a change right on the top. Um, in the in the uh, last round of survey, we got an incredible amount of feedback on the word unlocking. Um, earlier when we presented, we had working together, unlocking our future. Um, there was lots of good uh, generative talk around that word. Um, and it it really uh, creating seemed to, to resonate more with, with um, both our internal and our external stakeholders. Um, so we, we made that adjustment, working together, creating our future. Um, and then before you tonight are the four goals for strategic focus, uh, which are uh, teaching all students to be well-rounded learners, fostering belonging and inclusion, promoting community engagement, and investing in securing our long-term futures. Uh, we're suggesting underneath that each one of those uh, big, big visionary pieces um, our three uh, key strategic initiatives. I'm not going to read them all to you um, uh, here, but uh, I know you've read them uh, as we go. And each one of those strategic initiatives 
um, really comes out of the task force reports. Um, our, our team uh, over the course of 10 or 11 meetings, I think we had, um, uh, came up with an 87 page um, document of, of ideas for us to consider. Uh, some really good stuff in there and all of those uh, sub bullets there, uh, the ideas uh, for implementation key initiatives um, do come and are connected uh, to that task force. In one way or another. Uh, so with that, um, you do have a printed copy in front of you. Um, I'd just like us to, to open up that conversation. Um, and Gilbert is here tonight uh, taking notes um, on that, and I'll be jotting down some notes of, of things that we um, might like to rethink um, if there are any between now and, and final adoption of the strategic framework. Happy to answer questions, facilitate conversation. Well, I can share, no, no, I can share some thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time late at night going through this a few times, just really trying to absorb it. Um, and, you know, after going through it and reading all the details, you know, it's it's clearly evident the amount of time and the amount of input that was put into this has really fine-tuned it and distilled it down to the, the core um, of, of what we want to do as a community, as staff, students, uh, parents, and everyone coming together and, and getting it. So Herculean effort, and I just want to thank everyone who was a part of that and, and you know, um, and we have great facilitators, Governor Milana, for, for, I mean, I, without you guys, I don't think we could have come close to doing this. Because, you know, getting the facilitation is, is, is key. And then the community input makes it all happen. Um, some areas that I particularly like about this, and first of all, I don't have any problems. I think the community and everyone did a great job. I think this really captures everything. So I don't have any problems with it at all. I like the, I like the way it is. But some of the things that stuck out to me was um, in um, um, initiative is initiative or um, whatever the 1.2. Um, so on this one, uh, some of the words like identify and enhance, evidence-based instruction, meaningful assessments, you know, that's really getting down to kind of that innovation that I think the districts wants to do. We, you know, every school, you know, education system kind of tends to stick with things a long time. We want to think out of box. We want to do new things. We're going to try new things. And go for, I think that language really captures that. So I really like that. That point. Um, another one was uh, oh, something interesting. Um, uh, which one is it? Three point two. So just want to make sure we're not strengthening homeschooling partnerships. It's home homeschooling, right? So no, nothing. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh -huh. 3.3, um, what did I write, write down here on my notes? Um, oh yeah. So, so I, the thing about 3.3, you know, while they're, while they're in our, in our facilities, in our classrooms, we're taking in kids, but looking at before they come in and after, yeah, you know, reaching beyond just what's in the district, I think that's really important to look at. So I like 3.3 .3 in that respect. 4.2, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's we can make the best policies, the best curriculum, the best everything. If we don't have the personnel, the the, the skill sets to do that, um, and this is really important to me, make sure we are striving to get the best people on the team to to do that work that we're creating. And then finally, 4.3. Um, you know, coming from a technology background, this is, I have a, this is, um, you know, one of my special interests is making sure we're bringing the best technology to the classroom that can enhance, um, you know, the skills that we have. So, but again, overall, great job. Those are the things that stood out to me. I just wanted to highlight that um, I think the team did a great job on, on, on everything. David? So I'm actually, I, I've been going back and forth on 2.2. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan and I've had some good discussions around the language. Uh, coming out of the, the additional follow-up with Trustee Bruno, 2.2 was, it was worded, um, increase cultural awareness and prepare students to be global citizens through programming and all the rest. And um, 
it's changed to kind of mirror the creating our future, long-term future. There's some some harmony with that. So I, I guess I'm opening this up to to see what the board feels. Because to me, I don't wouldn't want to change something just to wordsmith something, but to me, like citizens of the future as our students, kind of like something forward thinking. But like to me, global citizenship or global citizens mean like that's what we want our students to be now. We want them to embrace this kind of diversity and just awareness and acknowledge that they're 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 maybe on the path, but maybe they're now. So I'm just curious as to what people think with citizens of the future versus global citizens. You know, is it again, I'm not I don't want to wordsmith something. I think the intent, no matter what, is still behind it, but just curious as to what others feel around the, this, if there is a distinction between, for, between those two, between global citizens versus how it is now, citizens of the future. Which one are you advocating? I, I'm advocating, I guess, for global citizens. They feel like it's a, it's a now approach and it's a, where we are in a kind of a global community versus citizens of the future seems to me like too much science fiction. I don't know what that future, like, it's just too vague. It's just, I understand why it was kind of changed to go along with our title of working together, creating our future, but creating our future makes sense in that title. I'm not sure it necessarily makes sense in the 2.2 realm, but maybe I've been looking at it too long. I, I I would second, I would agree with what you said, David. Um, I think too, well, like I said, I, I, I appreciate the sentiment of trying to um, connect with creating our future, but I would like the students to be global citizens now yeah. and not, not only in the future. Yeah, I, I could see that being uh, fine, I like the signaling back to our roots um, in terms of where it's in the plan. Um, the, uh, to me, either or, uh, but uh, I see where you're going with that and has no objection. Mr. Bruno. Okay, um, I don't know that I'm, um, this is not actually resistance. Like I'm not necessarily sold on on global citizens, but I understand the the resistance to citizens of the future. Just as I read further, like like I I, like I don't get the connection from that to hmm. embracing differences, increasing pride, and growing deep empathy. Right, like if, if that's what it's for, the yeah. citizens of the future doesn't say it. And I, I'm yeah, I'm anti-global. I guess it's I probably wouldn't if it said global citizens, I probably would have just skipped right over it. Citizens of the future did make you read it, being like. <laughs> Like, do they not, not and not it's funny maybe digging to us they do not already but the idea of like that collection of words doesn't immediately tie me to promoting understanding embracing differences and increasing pride in the rest do you of think it. global citizens makes that a connection i wouldn't I have separated that. it without it so i mean like in a yeah. sense that when i hear it now does that do that and the word citizen itself maybe yeah. covers it or even the word responsible instead of global so like that part i i'm to be clear i am not speaking against yeah, yeah, yeah. the word global i'm saying it doesn't actually do do it for me either in a sense but not in a bad way it just it, it, it does something but the word citizen in itself i think what we're talking about or inclusivity and belonging from above but i'm also not closing those words well what if um i i i see what you're saying um and i agree with all those points um what if we tweaked it slightly and signal to the content that's underneath and talk about increasing cultural awareness and prepare students for inclusive citizenship through programming, community events, blah, 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 blah. That, that conversation, I, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't in, like intending to. There's a way we want to say, I think we're all trying to say is, we want you to be engaged in citizenship in a um, uh, productive way. Uh, we want to see each other. Um, how do we uh, get people to want to be uh, responsible citizens? But part of that is um, 
understanding each other's perspectives. And that's where the inclusivity piece comes in. So citizenship, I think, um, has a generally positive <clears throat> Um If we included inclusive citizenship, could it uh, meet all our needs? Just because it has the inclusion part as the main thing. I, I don't like the inclusive part with the citizens because I think it, I don't know. Um, or you could just say citizenship. Be citizen, citizenship. To promote citizenship. Mm -hmm. Prepare students to uh, increase cultural awareness and prepare students um, for citizenship through. To make it even more uh, circumspect. I, um, I'll just, my reflection on the word citizenship, uh, that there's a process of becoming a citizen. Yeah, so, yes, yes. <laughs> that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. Trying to, maybe the that, that may not have a favorable uh, composition. Mm -hmm. How about members, like members of the community instead of saying citizens? Community members. Or something like that. I, I agree with you of uh, citizenship can have a specific meaning. Responsible community members. I was thinking responsible too. And, uh, and then it maybe opens up to like what is responsible. Yeah. But I like the members and I like the community part. I mean, students to be community members through, you have to community twice, but responsible community members. Anyway, I look at the word citizenship and I don't see it as a negative connotation right. because of how I learned about it. Right. No, I, don't I learned about it through like the Boy Scouts. You know, this yeah. is what you're supposed to be to be. This is what citizenship means, right? You kind of define what citizenship means. No, I don't look at it as negative, either. but I also hear the yeah. negative connotation about the process of becoming a citizen, right? And that may be not so positive a process for some people. Um, so it, in some ways, uh, there's, there's a lot of the words that we could use in this situation uh, when they're undefined can have connotations as defined by your personal experience. But part of the opportunity here is for us to go through and define what we think uh, um, a citizen or a member of a community should be, right? They should help old ladies cross the street. They should want to be involved in community pickups. They should respect each other's differences and celebrate them. Um, so, you know, there's an opportunity there to sort of define what our goals are. And that's a little bit like, the profile of a learner is about defining what our end product should be. Um, maybe we get to say what the different word, the connotations of the different words are that we're using, uh, unless we want someone else to define them for us. It's a tricky angle because acknowledging how they will define it is part of the cultural awareness that we're describing a few words before. So, like, we can push the definition, but you, you still think honestly they're going to. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I agree with your first. Like I actually don't know if the wordsmithing is 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 what we're doing or if we're just commenting. Um, preparing students to be responsible community members. If you just took the word community from below out, if you didn't want it twice, yeah, yeah. Programming events and internal practices move the word community up to be responsible community members. Um, the the hesitance that I was. Saying that I wasn't against with global, the word community in itself allows you to define at multiple levels, whether that is on site with your PBS program, PBIS, or, or at home, or in your neighborhood, or in your city, in your state, in your country, in your world. So, global literally makes me picture a globe, but if you just say the word community, I can picture whatever I want. So, you're saying, so you like responsible community um, members? Yeah. Well, just it, in that, in that yeah. version, that makes sense to me. And if the seeing the word community right below, Feels like too much of the word community. Remove it from the word community events. And you just say events. programming events and internal practices. I like that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not not to belabor the point, but just um, right back to our um, the presentation from redistricting partners, where we have approximately forty five thousand residents 
we have 24,000 uh, citizens of voting age. So of course, everybody under 18 can't vote, but we know we have 4,000 kids in the district. There are other kids who are too young to be in the district and kids who are too old to be in the district, et cetera. But I think, again, as the, it, right, it's every member of the community is gonna identify and define it for themselves. I know that we have lots of community members who are not American citizens. And so I don't, I, I don't know if, if that would feel, um, if that would have a negative connotation for them, if they would, and right, and the students too, right? The students um, may be US citizens or they may be US residents. So by starting to hear consensus around increased cultural awareness and prepare students to be responsible community members through programming, events, and internal practice in the dot, 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 dot. That would work for me. That works for me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Thank you. I had another I had another topic. Um, I really do like the working together, creating our future. I think I think that's great. Um, I believe maybe in a previous iteration, there was like the BRSSD logo, and then it said working together, creating our future. Um, I did really like that. Um, I'm uh, when I just think back to when the previous strategic plan was adopted. I believe it was 2013, uh, based on the materials we received, um, right? Of course, the global pandemic happened and we can all understand that. Um, I'm hesitant to, uh, I understand that we want to achieve these goals by 2026. I'm hesitant to put that as, um, as, a, as, as a very, very prominent part of the plan. I feel like if we need to rework the strategic plan in three years, we do. But if we're happy or the further board members are happy, I don't want it to be like, oh, guess what? It was vision 2026. 20, yes. Now it's vision 2030. It's still the same. <laughs> we just changed the year. So I, I'd rather just take the year out and just have it be your SSD, working together, creating our future. Let me ask this. Uh, that's a new twist. Um, how did, I suspect that came from staff. Um, how did that evolve? Uh, how did the Vision 2026 uh, three-year strategic plan? Yeah. Um, we, we felt like the goals that we uh, we're putting in here at least the, this, these larger buckets, we would make progress in getting there. Um, I'm not sure that you ever attain a perfect um, place in any of these. I think there's always room for growth. And I think our um, uh, roadmap uh, can continue to adjust and, and still match this framework. Um, I think there is opportunity in the future to, to maintain the framework, but maybe re-envision some of the stuff that falls within it. Um, you're, you're talking about maintaining the framework under the big boxes. Correct. So one, two, three, four. Correct. But some of these three bullets down below right. may change. For example, like there will be a time where our profile of a learner is completely operational. Right. So what, how does that, that, that shift right so you know the big big one through four kind of objectives or the i shouldn't say goals uh, the framework those one through four framework pieces uh can be maintained while we adjust some of the internal piece um i think there's an element of strategic planning that you want to also be time bound um so that um we are continually to focus on that goal three years out. Um, I, we, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but 
the branding piece uh, we haven't lost. Um, uh, we're still going to work on all the, the, the pretty stuff uh, and the packaging. Um, but I hear you in that maybe it's not quite so. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Northrup that the, um, having the logo on there was quite nice. Um, I also uh, can appreciate the putting a timestamp on it so that there's some pressure to actually go toward that goal, you know, but it doesn't need to be as prominent as is presented in this presentation. It's almost like we'd like to have um, some timestamps, but, okay. you know, some room to wiggle and adjust those timestamps. Um, and so um, what I'm hearing from Ms. Northrup is, is a desire not to be necessarily locked in and lose some flexibility around the um, framework and how we implement the flame framework. But I'm, what I'm hearing from um, Mr. DeGuara is that having some time urgency helps us get things done. So I guess the question becomes, how do we balance that? And can you, uh, can we ask you um, as a district to, to ruminate on that and come back with something that implements or includes exactly. both of those uh, ends of the coin. Not to be locked in but and maintain flexibility, but also to have some time horizon urgency Absolutely. to getting things done. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Yes, exactly. I, I love that the idea of the um, the goals is that they would be accomplished in three years. I think that's great. And to have that time frame. Um, as you're saying, uh, Superintendent Jaguar, just with the uh, the headings that we may want to keep those for longer, mm -hmm. I would love to um, have that be that you know if we are happy with these, if if yeah. the families and the staff are happy with these, that these could continue past 2026. Yeah. So the yeah. framework, I think, your intention for the framework is for that to move forward as our big budget. If it's working for us, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself because I think it's relevant can, here. Can I come back to yeah. uh, Mr. Leinbach had a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I was going to say about what Ms. Northrup said, but yeah, I mean, these, these are kind of like a core values. They should last throughout time. Maybe maybe the Vision 26 is down on the side here rather than up on the top. But yeah, the goals that we set, I mean, we're, every year we're going to set annual goals. And each of those annual goals is going to roll up into these three points below and each of the three points below rolls up in the first one. But yeah, just moving that 2026 20, down one level, I think would satisfy maybe both. But. I think that's a reasonable suggestion. Ms. Salinger, will you uh, advance the slide? So so this is uh, one graphic to help us kind of grapple with, with the piece. These are some of the visual uh, visuals that we've been working to create that has um, some icons in it has some verbiage, has, has something that that folks can relate to. Um, uh, actually, the, the, in these models, that vision is already um, a little bit smaller, but we can continue to rework that. Uh, the thinking is that when as we move forward, um, once the board um, adopts this verbiage, uh, actually, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll we'll have it in the form for the board to adopt, that you'll actually be seeing more of a graphical representation of this than just this chart in June. So uh, some of the ideas where we we're playing with a little bit is that interconnected kind of puzzle piece, uh, those linking uh, keys to the right uh, that help uh, provide a visual visual uh, and help us with some marketing collateral to, to make sure that our strategic plan is front and center and folks um, know it, see it, understand it, um, and um, are guided by it. So uh, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, happy to, to continue the conversation there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? That looks really good. I, I agree that I think it's, I'm I'm shocked, yeah. frankly. So it's awesome. how far we've come in such a short period of time and how quickly that came together. Um, there were definitely moments being part of the, the sausage making that I was not confident <laughs> that the sausage was going to get made or cooked or whatever. Um, but um, 
pretty impressive how well this came together. I, you know, and I agree that like having all the different perspectives from the different um, interest groups really was essential. And, um, you know, uh, appreciate the openness and willingness to have a discussion about these things that can become a little awkward sometimes. Like, what do we want to be? I don't know. And different things. Hmm. So, can we go to the next slide? Uh, I'm going to push you a little bit to just uh, share some thoughts. Uh, it'll help uh, guide us as we look at building on collateral, hopefully having even more of a uh, finalized uh, version in, in December. What are the things that, that, that you like, that you don't love, that you wonder about when you see those graphics? Know that the words are the same. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, different visuals. Uh, the icons from one side to the other um, are the same, just, just visually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a comment. Um, visually, when you do things left to right, it may imply a hmm. priority or a chronological. When you put things in the grid like that, it means they're all equally as important. So we probably want to think about those concepts when we graphically represent this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the puzzle pieces because it felt like they all have to fit together to make them more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me too. I'm team puzzle. Um, I feel like the idea that it all is necessary and goes together to 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 be the view. Whereas, um. Yeah, I think the the, the perception of, of ranking or maybe separation or stacking, um, and it just That's visually, I like it. I like it. Um, I don't know how I feel about the icons. Like, I think I think I feel maybe nothing with them. Um, like the long term future makes sense. Um, like I feel like I could like for the other three, I could I could be written interchange them. I think this is, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. <laughs> but like, like I could see any of for well rounded belonging inclusion and community engagement. Like, I could put any of them anywhere. Thanks. And as I look at them, like, belonging and inclusion, I could see the circle there and or the high five. So maybe fine tuning some of that. I mean, or, or not. Again, I'm, I'm, feel free to <laughs> do it, Mike. If we were really tricky, we'd have like four different uh, pamphlets that we hand out, one that had each one of those pieces in different spots, right? As we, the different <laughs> versions, because they all could be in any spot, they're all equally important. Yep. Well, I like the, um, I like the puzzle. I Just in terms of, of taking my glasses on and off because I'm like, and I, what is that bottom left? I think the gray is just a little bit hard to, um, to see, I thought it was an animal or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looked like a puma. Right? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. It looks like a pig when I'm. Like, <laughs> same thing. I first saw. Yeah. It's like hmm, that thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. But also, just the the gray of the of the rendering. It's not as clear. Like the one that really just stands out is obviously the blue. That's in terms of just visual, like a, a dark blue. Yeah. Dark. So I think maybe gray, like switch up the color. Yeah, over the different one. There's, you have that. You'll have to have some shadowing or something that allows the lettering to stand out a little bit better. But I thought I have like um, my eyesight was going bad. And I go, it's probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm just gonna say that that circular one we're gonna have to change because I, 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 I have labeled this now. <laughs> GRSSD pigs. And yeah. it could be a, that could be the new mascot. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what is that supposed to be if it's not a pig? What uh, it is uh, people, uh, people in, a in a circle. Yeah, oh, it's three people in a circle. Yeah. Oh, now I see it. <laughs> you really have to get close, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. well, I, I love the high five though. That's cool. <laughs> I do like the high five as well. Oh, that's yeah. like, I think with well-rounded learning, I'm not sure, but I still like a high five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, still high, but little fist bumps. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, maybe actually, actually well-rounded learner. You're right. Babies, and then, uh, <laughs> yeah. <I'm, laughs> <laughs> and, and Gilbert, Gilbert, our audience member, <laughs> said, uh, move the, the high five to maybe community engagement. Look at another uh, graphic for a well-rounded person. Yeah, it goes straight. 
the President Howard's up sausage yeah. making thing. <laughs> Always something. Good. Um, I definitely, you know, vote in favor of um, readability. Um, I did. <laughs> I did want to. I did want to uh, notice note that um, I do appreciate the um, using of the colors from the BRSSD logo. I think that's a good um, subtle or not so subtle signal, right? That although, of course, we're doing something new, some things are like I would not. I would not. Uh, encourage any you know thought about changing the logo at this time as well i think it's great to keep that logo keep those colors i think that's where we got the gray was um mm -hmm. trying to incorporate and then maybe we have the dark blue because a black background was mm -hmm. less than less than readable um or just wanting more vibrant colors but anyway i like i like the colors great great <laughs> Um, one thing to consider, Dan, um, so we've got BRSSD Strategic Plan Vision 2026 on this one. It'd be kind of cool if we could put that little mountain logo right in the middle of that puzzle piece somehow. Okay. Okay. Connect it all together. You know, be like a little circular thing in the middle. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Maybe there's a middle piece actually that has four sides. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you could, yeah, you could have the, the, um, you have a middle piece, then it could have puzzle pieces that go out from that middle piece, okay. as opposed to each, you know, the two the puzzle pieces being connected to the one just next to it, right? They'd all be interconnected. Okay. Super. Uh, I will um, uh, pass along uh, some uh, some kudos to uh, Jacqueline Kraft. Uh, Jacqueline has been helping us uh, design this and is, is uh, kind of the creative side. Um, of all this, so special thanks to Jacqueline. Uh, I don't want to forget uh, to thank our, our amazing task force. Uh, they did an amazing amount of work in a relatively short amount of time, right? So um, all of our teachers, community members, staff members um, uh, uh, classified that were, were on the, that uh, uh, team. Uh, much appreciation goes to them. So uh, thank you for this feedback tonight. I think uh, uh, Gilbert and I uh, took some good notes and we'll we'll connect. Uh, we're actually scheduled to connect uh, soon to, to get work done finalizing it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, on to agenda item number 12. Thank you. Thank you. Bert. Thank you, Gilbert. Congratulations on the <laughs> this is an information item from Ms. Eastburn. It's a uh, consideration of public notice of the California Employees <laughs> Associated Chapter 308 proposal to the Belmont Redwood Shores School District District regarding classified union unit collective bargaining agreement negotiations for 23 and 24. You've said it. Can I can I also ask you, are we taking um items uh 12 and 13 uh, together together? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then we also <laughs> considering uh, let's see, what's the next one? Consideration of public notice of the BRSFD. District oh initial proposal for California School Employee Association Chapter 308 regarding classified unit collective bargaining agreement negotiations for 2324. That's almost as far as I can tell. So I just want to point out that yes, um, these are the sunshine documents for both CSCA and the district, okay. and both um, CSCA and the district are sunshining articles uh, 13 and 14. 13 is salaries. For compensation and 14 is benefits. Is that it? That's it. Any questions, comments? Good. Okay, moving on. It's happening in detail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, facilities update. This is an, also an information item from the illustrious Rui Fowles. <laughs> All right, facilities update. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you guys have frequently seen this page that when we talk about facilities, there's three different categories of ongoing facilities projects, TK, maintenance, and energy efficiency projects. Um, the last energy efficiency project update 
Uh, in March, we had a presentation from NG. There's been no significant changes since then. We're just kind of progressing as planned. Um, with uh, solar panels going up this summer, uh, which is uh, and lighting upgrades all happening this summer, so there won't be a significant upgrade uh, update there. Speaking about sun shining. Speaking about sun shining. <laughs> uh, set me up perfectly there. Um, so on transitional kindergarten, um, so where we are in the process, um, you know, as as folks know, we've issued our bond, we finalized our enrollment projections and needs, um, we developed our RF. Q and RFP. Um, and so we are now at the stage of vetting and selecting um, our general contractor and architect. Um, as a reminder of our con context and constraints, um, we've reviewed our uh, enrollment projections and the implications, um, and therefore um, have written that into our scope with our criteria architect in terms of the schools that we're anticipating building at. Uh, so progress since our March facilities update um, we've conducted interviews with the two firms who submitted statements of qualifications. Um, so that was from the RFQ. Uh, we invited them both to submit a proposal. Um, after reviewing our proposal, uh, one of our two, um, one of the two design build firms notified that they would not pursue the project due to the low likelihood of building brand new classrooms. Um, they were hoping to mostly build instead of retrofit. Um, the RFP process also included an optional site walk, a written Q&A, uh, and a mandatory interview. Um, so we intend to invite uh, Block Construction Leonakis as our selected builder. Um, I will also note that in their RFP, they actually came in under the cost of um, what our criteria architect had proposed. Um, and uh, in addition, that Block is actually the firm that built most of the classrooms that we will be renovating. So I think as far as staying below, uh, sometimes when you see something come in below a projection, you worry that they might be forgetting something. Um, in this case, given that they built the classrooms, we, we felt really good seeing that. Um, and we're, we're impressed in their interview. Um, so next steps are, uh, we intend to uh, notify Block that uh, we will be moving forward. Um, and from there, we'll negotiate the contract. So the contract, you know, there's a lot of contingencies built in there. Um, we'll negotiate a guaranteed maximum price um, and uh, anticipate bringing that final contract uh, to the June board meeting. Um, so that in summer of 2023, this summer, we can start that design build process. Um, so that we will be well ahead of our schedule for uh, fall of 2025. Any questions on TK? Do a general question with commercial real estate, I guess. Do they, after they do all the design, is there anything in the contract that allows us, like if we notice things like kind of like, you know, like a warranty kind of? Like uh, yes, so there are. They, we can bring them back to fix things? That's yes, uh, it's a, uh, it's slightly complicated how that works, right? There's, um, so there's, there's always an option for like owner to add scope to a contract, for instance, but if you're talking about like literal guarantee of materials, so if you build a new yeah. sink, um, all those do come with warranties, yes. Um, where usually there will be issues is when your architect and your builder aren't well coordinated. So the architect says, you should be able to do this. And the builder says, well, I can't do this. And they start coming into conflict with one another. One of the reasons that we're, uh, that we are moving forward um, with the design build con, uh, type is that um, the your designer and builder are actually both involved from the beginning, as opposed to bringing in just an architect who's not talking to a builder or just the builder who's not talking to an architect, that they're both actually starting on the process from the beginning. Great. Cool. Thank you. Um, so as we're rolling out TK, mm -hmm. you know, every year we had three months to the the date, so it's it's gradually increasing. But again, this project is like twenty twenty five. So will will there be some classrooms that be retrofitted for next for the following school? You know, is it a ramp up of classrooms as well as? Or so from our capacity um, analysis, again, also keeping in mind that our kindergarten enrollment is declining, right? So that as kindergarten enrollment declines, some of those rooms can be repurposed for TK. We did not anticipate requiring extra rooms until fall of 2025. So that um, that said, preliminary, and we haven't actually gotten into the final design schedule yet, but in the preliminary process, they anticipate actually being able to be a year ahead and complete all um, of the retrofits by summer of 2020 or by school year fall of 2020. Okay. 
Excellent. Great. We'll be bringing a contract in front of the board um, uh, at the next board meeting then uh, with Block and Leonakis. Um, on maintenance, I also wanted to provide an update regarding our beloved Ralston sinkhole updates. <laughs> um, so progress to date. Uh, so as Superintendent DeGuara mentioned in his update, you know, when the first sinkhole appeared, we said, uh oh, freak accident, you know, repaired that section. When the second one appeared, we really wanted to take a much more comprehensive approach to this. Um, so we have had a geotechnical expert come out who has done a um, report and examination. We've cross-referenced that with old blueprints, some of which you've probably seen uh, in my office. Um, we've done uh, multiple excavations of the area to make sure that um, there were things that were referenced in blueprints that we couldn't find details about. So we did the excavation to actually um, make sure the extent of the corroded pipe um, as well as camera scoping. So sending down literal cameras um, to really map that out and make sure that we have a comprehensive awareness of really just every inch of pipe in that field. Um, and finally, we have a civil engineer who's been working on part of the issue is that um, because the pipe is still active, right? Repairing involves knowing how far deep down it goes and it goes past the fence line um, which then means that we have to do a topographical study of that as well. Um, and so uh, we've done the topographical study utility, utility surveying, as well as the boundary surveying, uh, along with a site assessment and schematic design. Um, so next steps are kind of meeting with the city of Belmont to talk through our new plans, um, as well as, uh, and then getting into kind of construction from there. So um, while it may seem like the area is just being fenced off, um, there have been folks literally out there with multiple instruments, um, just making sure, again, that we're taking a comprehensive and thoughtful view, um, not just in terms of repairing the pipe, but make sure, but ensuring that we're repairing it in a way um, that is responsible when it comes to um, considering the erosion down the hill as well. Any questions on that? We uh, anticipate requiring one more excavation before we can have plans finalized and budgets finalized. So we're still very much in that investigative phase. Yeah. Is this um, all on us in terms of <clears throat> the expense or does it I mean, even though it's obviously the sinkholes at Ralston, it, it, is, the, is it damaged because of pipe that's outside of that and therefore is one of the stakeholders like the city that would... The drainage pipe, um, I, I think that is a, um, a open question in terms of how far the pipe goes, which we um, are, are is one of the things that we're looking into, right? So if the pipe goes past our property line, um, are there other drainage pipes that go into that, things like that? So that, that's part of the investigation. And, and if, if it was found that way, then it's almost like, well, there might be other stakeholders that might... It could, It'd be a yeah. question about where the line of demarcation yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. So the the classic thing is the um, sewer lateral versus the main, right? City owns owns the mains. The even if your sewer lateral goes underneath the street, you still are responsible for it. Yeah. So it may get into what do we define as the main, and what do we find as as our responsibility from drainage from our property. Yeah. Um, and so I'm sure you guys will work through that, but it's always Bad and frustrating having had to do that project on my house one time. <laughs> there's, there's actually um, multiple entities that own property there, or that we think own property. Uh, we we own some property. The city owns some property, and some of it actually still belongs to to Notre Dame. Oh, really? Uh, based on on our. Oh, I mean the water dog park. Uh, yeah, I guess that. Yeah, within the park. Yeah, uh, I guess that's, right. that's still uh, Notre Dame property. Essentially. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have two questions for you. Um, one is, where the heck does this thing pipe start? Where does it start? Yeah. Um, and uh, my next question is, uh, how are we doing? Uh, we've got that one area fenced off. How is that going to impact uh, graduation celebrations for Ralston? So the footprint that, um, so in terms of where it starts, uh, the short version is it's, it it starts around the sinkhole, um, but in like a triangular fashion. And so um, one of the things that 
be was was interesting to find in our camera scoping was kind of um, if you imagine the bottom of Ralston, there's uh, drain pipes near the bottom of the field. Okay. And then for some reason, the way the water flows is it'll flow this way and then it flows up the field and then down. It makes this triangle. So there's a question of why do we need to do that? We think it was just I, we think that was built just to tie into that existing one. And can we close it off and just have this line drain directly? Right. Um, uh, so, and then in, in terms of this triangle, we also found a plan that referenced some kind of pipe kind of parallel to the bottom pipe. So that was the second excavation that we did of making sure that wasn't corrugated metal. So the reason that there was basically a quarter of the field closed off is we weren't sure the extent of um, risk in that pipe. Uh, when we excavated that and found that to be uh, clay and also properly cemented off and definitely inactive, uh, we shrunk the footprint to really just cover that triangle that was mentioned. Um, and so uh, a majority of the field um, is open now. Um, so it isn't that third that's fully blocked off anymore. We've shrunk that fencing footprint once we verified that that was safe. Um, so hopefully that will have minimal impact on, on graduation. Obviously that small piece there will still be fenced off. Um, you know, again, prioritizing the safety, we are gonna keep that fenced off until we, uh, you know, have it fixed basically. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Got yeah, next one. That's it for facilities. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, that on item 15. And now uh, we have another public hearing. Um, so uh, just a minute. Um, so the board will open a public hearing on. Uh, Preliminary 23-24 budget at 8.54 p.m. All right, uh, public hearing for our proposed budget. Um, so to okay. start this off- item is up for action, by the way. Uh, it's the action to have the public hearing first. Oh, okay. Do we have to vote on that? No. 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 Okay. Um, so uh, always starting with the budget process. Um, so we are in May. Uh, Monday was when we received um, the governor's suggested state budget preview. Um, so that is still being dissected by um, a lot of interested parties. Um, where we are in the budget process for next year is we've identified um, potential expenses Today's the first preview we have of potential revenues, um, and then we'll implement and adjust. So uh, this is just a preliminary budget. Budgets are always living documents, but right now in particular, I think um, is the, the goal of today is to get input on it for a final budget to be approved uh, in June. So a first look at the governor's revise. Um, big picture, there is a statewide estimated deficit of $31.5 billion. Um, education funding relative to uh, the state's overall revenue is guaranteed to be a certain percentage of the state's budget. And so what this means is that we have a forecasted three-year decrease of $3.8 billion to education funding in general. Uh, the governor's May revise um, tries to insulate schools, K-12 schools in particular, from declining revenues um, by making cuts to one-time grant programs. So they recognize they have a shortfall. Um, I think what, what I took from this is they have taken the feedback that they've heard over the last few years of ongoing funding over one time. And so uh, the governor is proposing an 8.2% fully funded COLA. Um, fully funded means, so the governor always says, here's the COLA, that the cost of living adjustment. And then he says, here's whether or not I'm going to actually give you that increase in your revenue. So he does intend to fully fund that in addition to funding a $300 million equity multiplier for LCFF. Um, to pay for that, given that there's a three-year decrease in funding of $3.8 billion, um, he plans to reduce the arts and music block grant by $1.2 billion uh, and the learning recovery emergency block grant by $2.5 billion. These were one-time funds to be used over uh, several years. Um, our apportionments on those two block grants are 2.5 million and 1.4 million respectively. And so the term was used clawback in that it is literally, they have already announced to LEAs what we will receive. And now they're saying, just kidding, we're going to take that back. Um, or we won't uh, pay you if we haven't paid you yet. Um, 
there's also a reduction on TK expansion funding. So there were some one-time implementation grants for that. Um, so reduction of that by 394 million. Um, the ratio is uh, currently anticipated to remain at one to 12. Um, there was talk of that moving to one to 10. Um, so especially with that decrease, they're currently planning to keep that at one to 12. Um, as a side note, we've always said, you know, there's state funding for TK facilities. Our chances at getting it are low. I would say our chances of getting it are now even lower. Um, but thankfully, you know, we again um, have that that bond funding that we that we were counting on the state for. Um, they are also proposing an additional 110 million dollars to fund universal meals. And before you get excited, this is not about the actual cost. This is uh, because they. So the way when the state announced universal meals, they said for every student that the federal government doesn't pay for their meals, we, the California will pay for it. Um, the uptick in that was higher than they anticipated. So it was actually an unfunded mandate for a little bit. They looked at, they, they budgeted, you know, X dollars to for this increase in meals. Um, it came in higher than that. And so this is their way of saying we will continue to just reimburse the meals that are happening. This is not any additional funding for that. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, there have been no additional details on Prop 28. Um, so that's the uh, arts and music funding um, that was passed by California voters. Um, hot off the press, the update from the county is we may not actually even see cash from that until the spring. Um, and there have been no additional legislative details about um, some of the things like supplement, not supplant, and, and other requirements. So it certainly makes it uh, tricky to plan for. Um, as far as our 23-24 budget goes, um, so the current version that you see in front of you um, is a balanced budget uh, with a few key assumptions to keep in mind. Um, it is uh, currently putting in a zero COLA because there are negotiations ongoing, so we didn't want to build in something before um, that was settled. Um, benefits are based on the dartboard, um, so no increase in STRS, a PERS increase from 25.37 to 27%, um, but as salaries increase, benefits will also increase because it's a percentage of salaries. Um, books and supplies, there's some decrease there due to multi-year contracts for software and lower books purchases, um, but not yet finalized, uh, as mentioned before, Prop 28 expenditures, um, and we need to build in um, a bit of changes due to the, the ECC. And then in the 5,000 sort of services, um, we have some minor increases uh, due to utility savings um, from solar. Uh, and what is not yet finalized um, is the cost of the expanded learning opportunities program, um, which Superintendent Hu will be talking about later, um, as well as uh, SPED contractors. As you know, that is always an area where you know we have obligations to provide a certain level of service. We're kind of looking at staffing levels relative to um, what we'll need to contract out in terms of whether those costs appear in your 1000s and 2000s or your 5000s. Um, so with that, um, this year, so projected 22-23, we have uh, expected revenues of 63.2 million and extensions of 58.2. Um, again, that's a lot of these uh, block grants, things like that. Um, next year, revenue is anticipated to be 55.7 million uh, and 55.2 million in expenses right now, um, though I expect between now and June for that expense number to go up and will net be deficit spending next year, um, which is to be expected given the one-time funding and kind of spend down of that, um, but certainly something we want to keep an eye on for ongoing. And uh, other fund summary, um, you know, cafeteria fund, uh, we do have a, a transfer from the general fund to cover some of the expenses there. Um, fund 21, that is our bond fund. Um, the reason that there's zero expenses there right now is because we haven't started that project yet. So there are no expenses built in, um, but we'll, we'll be uh, seeing an updated budget in the first interim there. Um, after we hire our design build uh, entity um, and then funds 25 and 35 are capital facilities and school facilities. Um, I anticipate that um, as we get a better idea of how much it will cost to fix the sinkhole, um, those are funds that will probably come out of there as well. Any? Oh, and then finally, um, planning process. So uh, March and April was when I had budget meetings with principals and department heads. Um, we're currently in negotiations. 
Um, and then in May, which is where we are now, uh, we have the governor's revised budget. Uh, yes. The governor proposes that, and then the legislature talks about it, and will they will adopt a budget uh, before July 1. And so between now and then, the governor's preview is the best idea we have. We don't know how the legislature will, will re respond to that, so it's just a little bit of, you know, listening to Sacramento gossip to update my revenue figures, uh, essentially. And June 15th will be the 23-24 budget. Um, Ms. Ellinger, uh, thank you for that lovely presentation. Uh, Ms. Ellinger, are there any other requests for public comments on this item? No, there are not. Okay, it is 9.02. Uh, we will close the public hearing at that time. And I'll open this up to board discussion. Fire away. Um, how does the how does it affect the, the grant and the arts and music? It looks like significant amount of money. I mean, to go back to that, and so I'm just, I mean, two point five million. So does that mean it's totally going to like decimate our like art and music program? Or? So sorry. Uh, so separate things. So um, there, when we talk about arts and music, there is kind of three different categories that we're talking about. There's kind of baseline what we have, which is funded by school force. Um, then last year, there was the arts and music block grant that was announced, which was a one-time funding of 2.5 million. Um, that is intended for, uh, the, the parameters of that is actually that it also includes general operational expenses as well. Um, and then after the arts and music block grant was announced, there was Prop 28, which was passed. And so I think after Prop 28 was passed, which has in it a supplement not to plant clause, um, the parameters that you could use the arts and music block grant was expanded a little, little bit in recognition that we kind of just, it was like an, un, you know, there was the voters and the legislature, both with interest towards arts and music. Um, and so in order to not double up on that, they expanded the parameters of the block grant. So our core program funded by school force is unaffected by all of this. Um, this was both of these were meant to be an expansion. And because of the uncertainty, we actually hadn't budgeted for things in that expansion yet because we haven't received guidance about what could be covered in the block grant versus Prop 28. So no to is anything being decimated because we had it was intended to fund an expansion, which is now a smaller expansion that we had carefully not overcommitted on. So we haven't used that expansion. That's correct. And would that, ex when we know what that is, does that equate to like people or is there more programs? Because I would hate to have, bring on somebody, right, a body, and, and then not have the funds to support. Prop 28 will be ongoing. Um, so once we figure out the details of that, I think that is something you could commit that towards people. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask that question in a slightly different way? Or that's nearly $4 million in grant, yeah, which is a big chunk of our uh, budget regardless. How does that loss of funding affect our budget? Um, so it it is not totally clear how they will reduce it, i.e. Um, in that overall reduction of $1.2 billion, whether they plan to do that in a equal or equitable way. Um, if they do it in a equal way, I believe the arts and music block grant is going to be reduced by 50% um, and the learning recovery emergency block grant by 40%. So not as big of an impact of 2.5 and 1.4. Correct. Yeah. If they do it equally. So it might be somewhere in the range of, you know, so it's for about um, $2 million. Yeah. Or less should they decide to, you know, apportion it based on your um, unduplicate account, for instance. I see. Okay. Yeah, because the state has basically said we want to reduce it overall by this much, but they haven't announced exactly how. So the back of envelope is saying, oh, well, you originally had a Porsche had allocated 2.4 to arts and music. You're trying to reduce that by 1.2. So back of envelope, maybe reduce everyone by 50 percent, but they could decide to reduce that in different ways. Could you spin back to the 8.2 percent fully funded COLA? We're in the middle of negotiations with our uh, bargaining groups, how does that impact that? Yeah, so our uh, next year is when we flip. So um, if you recall, we have anticipated sort of a zigzag um, uh, revenue for the next few years. So this year is a community funded year. Next year is a LCFF year. Um, so this still puts us in LCFF year. 
Um, the previously estimated COLA was 8.1, so 8.2 is a little bit higher than that. It hasn't changed the projections um, significantly. Uh, any other questions or comments? You guys are getting a thousand miles there. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bao. Uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the start of the Ching Pei show. <laughs> We'll go fast. Close that public hearing. I did. Okay. Uh, right. This one is also Hold public on, just a minute. I got to open this one. Yeah. yeah. This is another public hearing on our LCAP. Um, we will uh, open the public hearing on the LCAP at 9.07. Okay. So LCAP is something that we've been doing for years and years, and I think it feels pretty old hat to most of us by now. Um, the local control accountability plan is something that we work on throughout the year, even though you really only hear about it towards the end in May and June when we do this public hearing. And then of course the formal adoption, it is something that is living and breathing and gets edited throughout the year. However, um, there are requirements to communication. So if we'll go to the next slide, this is obviously way too much text for anybody to digest in any one fell swoop, but really it's, it's just to point out, these are all of the various input sessions that have been available to our community. We do it a little bit differently here in BRSSD through trial and error and knowing our community. We don't have a formal singular LCAP advisory panel. I, I think I've explained several times that even with personal outreach, that is usually attended by one person. Instead, we make sure that LCAP is talked about at every single opportunity at the site. So site councils, ELACs, DLACs, district-wide strategic plan meetings, LCAP is part of everything that we live and breathe because it is not yet another thing. It is integrated into all that we do. So these are just the opportunities I highlighted in green, the district-wide items. The blue is just site-based uh, for anybody who's interested. Our goals do not change from year to year. We do this on a three-year cycle. So this is exactly the same as what you saw last year. We had a 21 to 2024. 2021 to 2024 plan with three specific goals that are basically learning conditions, culture and climate, and student engagement. That continues unchanged. What we do have that is different each year is through all of the stakeholder engagements, through the various meetings, through piecing together our strategic plan task force work, through looking at the survey results, we see themes. The interesting thing, I think it's a little bit like homework. We have pretty much equal number saying we need more tech, things like personalized technology, individualized access are great for helping my kids close the achievement gap. On the other side of the coin, we also have, my kids are spending too much time on tech, get rid of the tech. <laughs> so it's, it's this fine balance of always ensuring we have access for supporting kids, but also making sure that it's not the primary tool. Tech is supposed to be something that we use to help learn. And that's something we're seeing in our community we want access, but we want to be strategic in use of it. And we want to be judicious and not over overuse. Um, I think some of the con comments are consistent from year to year. There's still a strong desire to support SEL and counselors. And there is a really strong desire. And we've, we all heard it through the various task force meetings with Gilbert and Lana for more communication. Those are, those are key points that keep coming up. We had decent participation this year. Not great, but you know, better than last year. So that's a good thing um, because we also had tons of feedback opportunities this year. So that one LCAP survey was one of many opportunities. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. You heard from Talia earlier tonight, all of the different actions she was talking about in her SIPSA. All of those are included in the draft LCAP that you have, which is in rough draft format right now, because this next month is when Bruy and I really get real tight and we always spend a lot of time looking at numbers together but this is when we we make sure every single dollar I mean, we're talking like a 42 million dollar budget we make sure every penny is accounted for between all of the various extra sources and then what's in supplemental so things aren't complete now and that's okay but you you heard from talia all of our principals went through the engagement process at site council to come up with different goals based off of the feedback that they were hearing that are included into our LCAP that then align back to our three main goals. Um, so there's just a few things that are listed. Really exciting to hear from the sites, all, all the new, new tasks. I wanna say we added about 30 new actions this year. Hmm. 
Um, a question had come up in email, so I wanted to make sure we address this. The LCAP is primarily documenting what we do with our supplemental dollars. Yes, we have a base grant that goes to paying pretty much salaries, but what we are at, what we are allocating out in the, I don't know, something 175 actions now between the three different um, goal areas is what we do with the supplemental dollars. The students who are tagged as unduplicated, so English learner, foster youth, and or socioeconomically disadvantaged, bring in supplemental dollars to the tune of 1.191 million in our district. Approximately half of it goes directly out to the sites. You can see that the sites have differing amounts because we allocate it based off of their unduplicated pupil count. Higher concentration schools get more money because they have greater needs so that they can allocate their dollars. There's a big chunk that's left at the district office level, not because I'm keeping it all and hoarding it, but because there are some district-wide implementation that just like school force works, there are things that we can get economies of scale when I manage. So we pay for a reading specialist, we pay for science specialists, we pay for, right, we, we fill in holes all over the place. Um, and those are all outlined in the actions. Any action that doesn't have a site specific name in front of it is a district wide action. Um, and then the next slide. So here are again, some increased and improved services that we just listed out that are categorized, nothing different. There are a few little tweaks, but really our principles have gotten good. We're refining, we're being more specific. Um, the data analysis that has gone into this year's actions is far improved. So I think in terms of growing the process and really making this a living, breathing process for us, um, we're making real gains. And I think that's what's important. The other thing too is the first couple of years we did this, the county came and watched to make sure we were following process. I think now we've earned the reputation that we do this right. So they don't even show up anymore. <laughs> um, next slide, please. This is just an FYI of the last two steps. We're doing the public hearing today. County is working on their review. They will give us all of their feedbacks as they check for all the dotted I's and T's and making sure our pennies line up as well. Um, we will take any feedback that comes in um, and edit and obviously finalize the draft. So it's not so rough for you. And in June, when you see the document, it will be ready to go and, and done. Questions? Oh. Uh, Ms. Ellinger, are there any requests for public comment? No, there are not. Uh, seeing as there are none, the board will close the public hearing at 9.14 p.m. Uh, now, are there any questions or comments for Ms. Hughes? Seeing as there are none, <laughs> we will move on to your next item, which is the ELOP uh, program. This is an action item. Yes. For real. So this one, I did not prepare slides for you because this is, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's pretty straightforward. This is the written documentation of how we are plan how we are providing the expanded learning opportunities programming for our students this year. The attached, the, the plan is attached. You've seen it in your documents. Ultimately, this school year, 22-23, we ran 100 we're in the middle of running 180 days of programming where we alternated a few weeks at every site. So as an ELOP eligible child, you were invited to attend when your site hosted um, between five and six weeks. It was just the weeks didn't work out perfectly. So Nesbitt has the greatest population. They've got the longest chunk. They're in now until the very last day of school. And then during the summertime, we are using learning loss recovery block grant to pay for the summer 30-day program. So this is this is the dance, right? Like what the state gives us for ELOP does not cover even the year-long program, yet we have to do 210 days of programming. We're good for a couple of years. We are going to have to figure out next steps as we figure out the state. But ultimately, going into 23-24, we are doing things a little bit differently. We use this as a learning year, as a year to really finalize what our guidance is and what the audit guidelines are going to be. Going into 23-24, Every single school site, with the exception of Ralston and Nesbitt, will have an on-site provider that is ELOP compliant, and all of our students who are eligible will have priority to enroll. So the Fox kids will have priority to enroll in the San Carlos after school that is housed at Fox. So there's no transportation required. We've already worked this out with all of our after school providers. There's another change. For 23-24, we got clarification on the law 
students who are uh, classified as foster youth or socioeconomically disadvantaged are not charged a penny. We, we wouldn't want to charge them. We're not allowed to charge them. We will pay for whatever we get from the state directly to the child care providers, whether that be Footsteps or San Carlos Charter Learning or, or Sandpiper Youth Club. All of the various vendors that we have on sites will absorb all of our foster youth free and reduced lunch and socioeconomically disadvantaged children who want to register. Those invites have already gone out to families. We've asked that they reply to us by May 31st so we can reserve their space and so our child care providers can plan accordingly because this changes their numbers. It changes the need for facilities, which we are working on as our partnership. That's happening at all of the individual sites. I say with the exception of Nesbitt and Ralston, because Ralston only has 10 or so ish sixth graders going in next year who are going to be considered free and reduced lunch, socioeconomically disadvantaged or foster youth. We will provide transportation for them. And this is where we're still working out. Are they going to go down the hill to Nesbitt depending on our transportation needs and, and ability to kind of fulfill that? Or are they gonna go up the hill to Fox? They will be offered a program, they will be free. The English learners, the second half of our kiddos who are ELOP eligible will be reserving space for them as well, but they will be responsible for tuition to the child care providers. And those who are English learners who don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, who may still need some financial aid because they can't necessarily afford the whole program, will deal with, will, will apply through aid and have a sliding scale through our providers. But we as a district are only paying the tuition rate for those who are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged and foster youth. Okay. The other site that doesn't have an on-site, it's not that Footsteps is leaving Nesbitt. Footsteps will continue to operate. Nesbitt has a very large population of ELOP eligible students. We will be contracting to bring in a program. So it's not your free and reduced lunch qualified. You go to this program and you, you can afford to pay. You go to that program. All of the kids will be offered the same program. And they are obviously welcome to choose between. But we will have a program at Nesbitt for Nesbitt kids. TK through six that runs after school till 530, 180 days this school year. It's just too many kids for us to say to footsteps, can you please absorb them? It, it's just not doable. Uh, because every child that our child care providers accept from us, they're operating at a loss. As those of you as parents know, you could not put, you could not pay for 10 months of after school care for $2,000 and we're getting 2,054 per child. Is that interesting? Mm -hmm. From the state, 2,050. So as a partnership and as our, you know, as our community members, they are operating at a loss so that we can make sure we can support the students who need it the most. Um, that's the plan for ELOP moving into 23-24. Every site will have their own. Based on the on-site child care providers, they're all ELOP compliant. This also kind of helps us spread the logistics of it. It makes it such that kids are participating in a program with their peers, and it's not different depending on who you are and what you qualify for. Uh, and then we are just having a vendor come in for Nesbitt and we'll decide where Ralston goes, depending on where we can work out transportation. But everyone will be off. <laughs> questions? I said the question. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. And I um, really appreciate all the work that you've put into this. Um, just just the thought that just came up when you were mentioning um, the uh, that for most of the school sites, it's going to be the after school yeah. provider. And then you said at Nesbitt, there will be. We, we're ha we are finalizing a contract with Lagarza okay. to provide on site for 180 days. Okay. And then footsteps will also we'll operate. Operate, yeah. So I'm just wondering how kids are going to feel about whether they're going to Lagarza or footsteps, right? Whereas at the other sites, they they will all go to Belmont, St. Carlos, Belmont. Yeah, Apple. I mean, they'll all go to the Sandpiper Youth that's Center. That's tricky. I mean, so actually, that's actually a perfect example because at Sandpiper, kids will either be going to Sandpiper Youth Center or Champions. Oh, okay. Ready to, okay. Program to operate. And so, so I think there's a little bit of a parallel in that in Nesbitt. It's just we have two programs and 
we're going to invite you to and let you know the registration. And as a family, you can say, you know what, I've been going to footsteps all this time. I'm just going to stay going there. And that's totally fine. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Sam? Um, <clears throat> that was a very good document that you gave, a lot of good program detail. Um, so I read through it, and, I, and I, some of the questions I had uh, specific to the to the Nesbitt part was La Garza, first of all, anecdotally, and, and also my son has attended the sports. I think they're great. But my question is, is how many students are, when you say the largest population of ELAP eligible students in Nesbitt, how many students roughly would you anticipate that will be? So we started doing our survey <laughs> past week and we had a fairly low conversion rate when we offered ELOP this year. And when we survey the families, mostly it's because the five or six weeks was disruptive, right? Like not, be, not being able to do it all year was a problem because you make plans and we all know what that's like. Um, so far of the responses we've gotten and what we did this this time around was we sent it through form stack so it's individualized and we know who's responded and who hasn't so that we can continue to follow up and jerome has been helping us send reminders you haven't you haven't responded yet please respond um so far of the i would say we have about 95 percent of those who qualify for free or reduced lunch saying yes i want to participate so we will be following up with them with all of the registration information um, so they can get themselves registered. So I think we're looking at 100 kids in Nesbitt. So my, my question is, is so Lagarda is looking through kind of the, the difference between the on-site provider, I'm assuming maybe that's footsteps in Lagarda. Is it Lagarda has sports, as far as I know, sports and STEM activities, right? And they're very good with that. But I guess what's what seems to be missing looking through the samples that you go through them. Yep is it seems that are they strong enough in the academic support and enrichment curriculum? I'm assuming the enrichment maybe they could be, but have because I don't know if they've ever done the academic support module like Footsteps has, and, and with any group, with any kiddos, we want them to make sure that, the, you know, there's dedicated staff that can help them with homework. And I'm just, I just would like to know what, like how are they gonna shore maybe that up if I, that part of the other on-site providers? So they, they have been our ELOP provider all year, and we've been working through all of the feedback and, and have worked with them. The feedback from the families who have participated have said that the STEAM activities have been one of their kids' favorites. So um, the the response rate is always, is never as good as you hope it to be, right? Like you, I want to hear from more, but the ones that we've heard from, the, the I mean, there are one or two comments of, I wish there was more steam or I wish there was more homework, but I, otherwise every comment has been positive. Kids had fun. Kids did a lot of steam activities. I, I just met with the team to talk about how we want it to be more structured and for there to be more hands-on activities. Um, the homework support and set is something that they've, they're able to handle okay. and they're able to do. Um, okay. So every, every program, whether it's the on-site provider or the contractor we've chosen, every program submitted an ELOP readiness plan to us last year that they have updated and confirmed to be continuing. They have to be ELOP compliant in order to rent from us. That was my question is, is Lagarza ELOP compliant? So you're Absolutely. I guess the, um, so then the other one, is there any kind of co coordination between both, specific to the because you're having two different providers so that there's continuity and and one doesn't feel like they're getting something in footsteps versus. That's something we're gonna have to work through. Um, okay. I think I think that's always tricky when you have multiple programs. The, the consistency is that in order to be ELOP compliant, you have to have an academic portion, you have to have physical activity, you have to have snack, you have to have enrichment. Those are the pieces that have to have to be, the ratios have to be consistent. So on, on paper, the programs are going to be fairly equivalent in that sense. Um, the improvement on this year's Lagarza program to being a full-time program at one site is going to be the dedicated staff. They will have the same six staff members there every single day rather than they they have the same staff members, but going from one school for six weeks to another school for six weeks makes it really hard to build relationships. So the staff will be there. They will be able to have that coordination with the school site the way I think our on-site care providers are able to have with the classroom teachers. 
which will only strengthen the program. And so then it's going to be family selection to decide who who gets which provider at that site uh, versus. What? We are going to send out the invites and say, here's, are you interested first? And then based on the numbers, we will okay. figure out, do we split them? Do we, um, we're going to work out kind of those details, but it is something more sensitive to that. We don't want the Lagarza program that we are paying for to be all of the kids who are on free and reduced lunch. We're also sensitive to the fact that there's something like 75 kids who qualify for free or reduced lunch, and we can't ask what steps to absorb all of them. Right. And one, one final question, uh, you said mentioned that there might be a deficit going forward or there currently is, but we we're covering it. What what is what is that deficit? Can you put some can you share at this point what's it kind of depends on how many kids enroll. Um back of envelope, I mean, so we receive what twenty five hundred dollars in funding per student. So to not per month, it's per per year. Per year per student. <laughs> um <laughs> to provide yeah. both the after school program and the summer program. <laughs> and so we this year we we have we have gotten external grants to cover the summer program so that we can allocate that 2500 per student to just the during the year program which this year rotationally allowed us to break even next year you know so again it really just depends on en enrollment matters a lot um i do think at the very least the cost of summer school i I think it would be difficult to break even just with the after school program. So at the very least, the deficit, the structural deficit will always be the summer program. Summer program is always going to be at a loss if we if we're not able to find. And that costs about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. OK, so we're not a million, but two hundred and thirty thousand per year will be a loss. OK, thank you. But you're not talking about at a loss to the community members that are supplying the programs. I mean, a general fund contribution. I mean, you mean us, us as a district, we're the ones that are taking all correct. Lives. Not with steps, not the Garza. No. Not on, not on the ELs. Not on, not on the ELF eligible students who are only categorized as English learners. For the families that, for the students that are categorized as free and reduced lunch and or socioeconomically disadvantaged slash foster youth. They understand that we will pass 100% of what the state gives us to them for tuition, but that is at a loss to their, they they are covering it. That's a difficult. It is it is a difficult, yet at the same time, it is a commitment that we've, I mean, we've met with all of our child care providers multiple times and they are all on board with, we want to provide the kids who need care, care. And we will work with our, they've, they've worked with their treasurers, they've worked with their boards, understanding that what, what it means to them. So they are taking a lot. I mean, they are accepting, maybe not a lot, but they are accepting. They're ultimately giving, they're giving more scholarships yes. than they've given before Got in it. order to make it work. It. So, and we're giving them funding. And we are giving them 100% of what the state gives us for these kids. So it's not 100% of a loss, but, you know, it is, yeah. it is operating at a higher scholarship rate than they have. It's not market rate. Yeah, it's not market rate. It's not market, market rate. rate. Correct. Okay. I guess the pivots back to how is that sustainable for them too? I think we're all in a little bit of a let's see what enrollment looks like this year place, right? They've all historically given scholarships as well. Obviously, this is taking it up to a higher number than before. Um, and so I I think everyone in the conversation we had, everyone understands that this is a, a usually handed down. Uh, you know, this is a handed down mandate, like we need to provide this at our sites. I think we were um, very honest in saying that, you know, we need we need to partner in this together. Um, in terms of what sustainability looks like, again, it, it really looks like enrollment. It really depends on what enrollment looks like. And we don't really know the answer to that yet. So I think we're all in this experimental year to evaluate. Meaning if we have high enrollment, that's bad for sustainability or if we have low enrollment that's bad if we have high enrollment i think it makes it trickier for sustainability mm -hmm. often that it's underfunded mm -hmm. high enrollment high full-time enrollment makes it harder for sustainability however there is flexibility right that's one of the things that we weren't sure last year coming into this we were like you have to you have to participate the whole time because like that's that was our understanding the the clarification is families need to choose what makes sense for them so if we have a mixture of kids on part-time enrollment, 
if, you know, every two kids, you have one on a three-day program and one on a two-day program, that's like accepting one full-time scholarship rather than two full scholarships, right? So it does help the budget piece for the accepting program if kids choose to go part-time rather than full-time. I, I would also throw out a reframe of rather than thinking about it as a loss, thinking about this as just another way to provide for our students with the highest needs, right? And so, you know, the other open question is, when we have this program available for them free of cost, what does that mean in terms of their academic learning? And is this actually a way to invest in bridging disproportionality Absolutely. and making commitments from like our constant supplemental and concentration funding, for instance, which serves right. the population? How does this if this is one of the most effective ways to support them, is that maybe where we fund this from, right? So I, I, I would push us to not just think about this as us, but rather as a as it's, it's, it's just, I mean, it's going to cost something. And I think what it, it's going to be good for kids, the more kids who need care, who are getting care, who are getting to stay on campus and have extended learning opportunities and have enrichment, the better for all of us. Right. So we're just going to have to figure it out. And I think our partners have been really committed. And like Rui said, we we've been really honest about what we're getting from the state and we're going to work it out together, but it's not a and I'll be all, and this is all the money you're ever getting, period. Because remember last year at this time, we were telling you they were giving us 670-ish dollars and now it's up to 2,000, so. Yeah, there's no um, doubt in my mind that it's a good thing to do from our perspective and reframing it from the district perspective, I think seems valid, but our partners are businesses yeah. that struggle to meet ends regardless. And so uh, imposing that on them without uh, a clear plan forward in terms of meeting those expenses. It's not just the number of kids, it's their staff that they have to hire and not flex up and down. It is It is partially why we chose to have our on-site care providers do it on-site because it is shared. The load is then shared, right? Like we have something 250-ish kids who qualify across the district, but we're talking five kids at one site, 10 at another. Nesbitt has a high concentration, but everyone else is in the low double digits. And so when they looked at their books and their budget, they felt like they, it wasn't, it was doable and it was just through our contributions support. And again, if, if, if participation ends up really high and this is a great program for these students with high need, that, you know, is that thousand dollars gets relocated from else? Right. Exactly. So what, that we would, as a district, then supplement those the cost of those programs so that the providers don't go under. Right. If it, right in if the same way, to be the, the the best thing, then that's. I mean, this is what we decide through our stakeholder engagements of what is the best use of our supplemental dollars. Where are we where are we making that investment? Right. So I just want to be mindful going forward um, to keep track of. Is that is footsteps or the on-site provider going to be kind of passing that that expense forward? Because last year, as a footstep family, we did get a letter from footsteps saying that because of some incurred costs, they were going to be raising tuition fees. And so, you know, in retrospect, you know, we understand the reason, and and but it's not a for or or against it. It's just it's just that there might be some families impacted, yeah. as we heard in the public hearing, right? Yeah. It's just a reality that cost of care is going up. And so I just want to be mindful that, as, as President Howard just said, it, they're, they're in for a business. They might be a community member, and, and, and we appreciate that. Yeah. We, I just want to be mindful all around that it's not somehow being passed along so that other families are impacted too, even though ultimately as a district we are, it will benefit our kids and and their enhanced learning. Yeah, and it, it it will benefit and it is also something we have to do. We we've looked we we looked into this because that's part of our concern. If we don't want to be the bad partner that says figure it out, but at the same time, we can't even say take the money. We 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 can't, it's not sustainable, we can't do it. We have to do it. Period. Um, when we talk about if participation is, is high, how is capacity decided? The good news is 
we own the rooms. So um, the, they're, we are partnering with them already to let them know what the enrollment is looking like. A good number of our English learner students are already on their rosters. They're already kids that are served by. So that's that impact isn't going to be huge. The, the bigger impact is these kiddos that we now offered free care to that have not had free care. Yeah. Um, and that's where we are. Work, I mean, we've get, we gave them numbers, I want to say three months, two months ago about projections. So they're already hiring up and staffing up. Um, and then we're continually updating the number that we give them of who's actually said they're interested. And then we'll watch that conversion rate. Of and actual with them on the rooms that they're licensed for and things like that. Perfect. And then when you say um, English learners and free and reduced lunch and foster youth, like reserving their spots up to that point of capacity, how are the other spots build in a sense that like you have 30 spots and 50 apply? The reality of it is we have to provide for every child who qualifies who says they're interested. I will also add that if you take their current rosters okay. and then you add the unduplicated students and then you look at the number of rooms they're licensed for, there is capacity to fit all of the okay. above. So that is something we looked at. So we had everyone tell us what are you what rooms are you licensed for? You know, looked at those numbers. And so they have the quite literal capacity staffing aside, the, the physical the physical space facility space. capacity to take on 100 percent enrollment. And you know, you don't fill it up with others who would want to pay in full cost. Like you have capacity for 180 that you have to serve. Those 20 spots get filled by somebody who's paying, or is that just not a thing? No, then so I'm saying let's say you serve 50 right now. Yeah. Uh, and you have space for up to a, so if you serve 50, what we did was we say, how many are you serving right now? Let's say 50. Um, how many more might you get? Let's say 50. Yeah. Oh, you're licensed for 120. We're all good. I think uh, what so if, Bruno is asking is, as they expand, if if they have licensing for they've always actually had this licensing. So we, we this isn't new licensing. They've always had licensing to expand up to. They this. can certainly take on more students at full pay mm -hmm. so, as they hire and and grow their program. There's there's no there is there's no limitation for months that says your program can only have eighty kids and it has to be one hundred percent our kids and that's it. The limitation from us is maintaining ELOP ratios, which is actually higher than licensing ratios. So we have to maintain 10 to one in TKK and 20 to one first through sixth. Licensed child cares have to be 14 to one. Mm -hmm. So that 20 to one is kind of a moot point. Like they're running at 14 to one. They are also overstaffing on a regular because they know people call in sick in and out and extra bodies are a good thing. Um, so we are working with them with, here's how many are saying yes. We are communicating to our families that there is a deadline because we, these are businesses. They still need to be able to plan and we need to get people to register as early as possible. We're giving them the information now so that they can plan. I mean, they have to plan for themselves too, what the care is going to be like after school. The reality of it is come September 1st, if a parent enrolls and or has been here all along and decided to change their mind and they want to enroll in their on-site care, we have to work with our providers to make it happen. Yeah. Um, but the more we can get people to commit now, the less of that kind of fire drill at the last minute, the better for everybody. Um, kind of building on what Mr. Bruno said, um, I'm just wondering you know, if this might be helpful to the childcare providers um, and specifically thinking about Nesbitt, um, <laughs> excuse me, is um, if, if, if the district contracts with Lagarza for a hundred students, but only 80 students sign up for it, can Lagarza then advertise to the community? There yes. are 20 spaces yes, available. See, that's, that's what okay. we've done. We've done this, like if there are extra spaces, they can. Okay. Um, and I that's something we work out because they're, I mean, like that's, that's in that contract negotiations piece because we are paying for a hundred kids yeah. at their rate. And if we fill 80 and they bill me for a hundred, mm -hmm. that's a problem. If, if the programs for a hundred and they bill me for 80 and then fill those 20, that's fine. Or we pay for the hundred and they, they find 20 elsewhere, but then they take that off my bill. That's also okay too. But we have to be really careful in, in the piece, but in terms of, if there's space, can we open it to people who want to pay to enroll? Absolutely. Priority first being ensuring that our ELOC eligible kids have 
the program that they're entitled to. And I, I think that would um, that would help my earlier question about our kids going to feel like there's a difference, right? And of course, there will there will be a difference. They'll know that they're going to Footsteps or La Garza, but um, for for the kids' uh, self concept of right. which program am I going to? If that's a, a mix it's of status, kids. exactly, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that's why we're monitoring that interest really carefully at, as they come in. But I think I know the answer. Um, are they required to be multilingual? They are, the, providers. the providers are not required to be multilingual. They are, they are required to provide support to our students. Um, yeah, no, there's that, there. that been an issue. It, I, I think all of our on-site care providers have multilingual staff. It is a priority for them as a community, but it is not a requirement. Um, Lagarza staff, I believe, also have multilingual staff. I mean, like summer YMCA, the YMCA is providing our summer program this year, for example, based off of our population last year, as they hired assistant teachers and coaches for the summer program. All but one teacher is actually our, our staff. So there's an outside person as well, but they, New to hire Russian speakers. There we go. Such a high population of this language of, yes. So, so they have Russian speaking staff to support, knowing that we had such a high level of Russian newcomers last summer. Right. So that's that that personalization and and one-on-one -on -one conversation that I have with all, with our vendors to work through the details. Right. I think that was addressing it. So I guess the program is for them. Does it work or whatever? Can it work? Yeah, not a requirement. It's a, it's a, it's that preferred item on your, on your resume, and you know we'll do what we can. Uh, any other questions and comments? Okay, seeing as there are none, uh, thank you, Miss. This one is up for a oh, that's action right. and yeah. for the board final rule. Expanded learning opportunities program and plan as presented. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye, the motion passes. Okay. Uh, item number 18. Use your board, board meeting me. agenda item. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, uh, it will be uh, location change. Oh. Uh, we will set up, we will have our board meeting at Sam Piper School. Look at that. I will make sure that we're uh, getting that information out. It will also be a 5 p.m. start. Uh, like tonight, uh, we'll look at whether or not we should adjust that uh, in the fall. But we've already publicized the 5 p.m., uh, so we're 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 kind of holding to that there. Um, it is our uh, regular busy June agenda with budget and LCAP adoption. Uh, there's dashboard indicators that are part of that adoption as well. Um, public hearing statement of reserves, uh, TK. Instruction and contract approval. Uh, again, there's that uh, uh, CBRA stuff. Uh, strategic plan adoption. Uh, Ching Pei will be presenting recommendations for world language and SEL. Spanish, uh, correct? Only Spanish this time, and I'll explain the process. Great. Yeah, only Spanish. And then um, uh, we'll have a public hearing and resolution for Prop 30 uh, education protection accounts. So. Looking forward to that, Sam. And Sam Piper, would that be in the MUR? Or? Uh, it's going to be in the science building. Is, uh, is it one of the two stories? It's uh, it's the ground floor of the two story. Yeah, it's oh, okay. It, the larger room. Um, we we uh, would have had to abbreviate our meeting if we uh, use the multi use. They have uh, time constraints. The community. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's a good space. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll set it up nice and do it all. Are we gonna get grub that time? We're gonna get. Are we gonna get grub in June? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, you'll you'll have, you'll have what's left over at the table there. <laughs> Sorry, budgetary <laughs> cutbacks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dang it. Yeah, right. uh, you want to come before <laughs> yeah any other questions comments <laughs> at, budget or meeting and then I'm, I'm just I'll, I'll i'll put this out there if if 
with a 5 p.m. We, we, we can back up even earlier and do closed earlier if that's or for, no. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> this will be Got another it. one where we have we can do. pizza the close. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Pizza. And um, yeah, and I'm not seeing anything from the bargaining groups on the uh, agenda items at this point, but is it probably too soon? And do you expect uh, where do you expect those? Uh, we have a bargaining session scheduled uh, tomorrow. Um, I will say the tenor at the table is really um, positive, both. Uh, similar to what you were saying, uh, your thanks. The, the teams are working hard and having good conversation. Um, I think it always, it, it typically takes a little bit longer than anybody um, wants to, but that's that's what happens when we have a good conversation and really try and um, identify interests and, and uh, next steps. So um, team will meet tomorrow. Uh, I'll continue to provide the board updates. Um, but we don't, we don't, we're not that close to, to being able to put it on the agenda yet. But um, of course, things change and who knows how closely we'll get to by June. There's a possibility, but if it doesn't, um, we don't get there by this meeting, then we would first meeting next year. Uh, likely, um, I will say if uh, it all depends. I think once we get um, an agreement, we reach agreement, I think it behooves us all uh, to see what we can do if it's not aligned to a, 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 a regularly scheduled meeting, uh, consider um, a special session if if it so works out. Uh, if not, it would be in the fall. And if we're talking about that, that's sort of like we come, we vote, we Correct. Out, yep. like a 10 minute meeting. Hopefully. Correct. Okay. Yeah. It was easy during the pandemic. We could do it virtually. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we have to come uh, here, but uh, we could do it. Okay, so on the 12th. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, I think that that is it for our agendized items. Uh, so I, at this time, I think we're going to convene to close. It is 9.49 p.m. And for uh, public uh, consumption, maybe watching, uh, there will not be a uh, report out of closed. Okay. So we're gonna uh, convene to close at 9.49 p.m. And we just need to wear it for the the uh, evil overlords on the internet to be.